All right, folks. Good morning. Welcome to the second day of our vendor summit. Um, just a couple of things before I hand it over to our first talk of the day, including I'm going to take these chairs off the stage because we don't need those. Um, if uh, the wire everybody's wireless access has been extended for a second day using the same password from yesterday, if for some reason you have any problems with that, please see Jishnu and he'll figure out what's up with your wireless credentials. Um, the foundation has brought a bunch of cool swag on the back table. They would not like to have to take any of it home. We'd really like it if you would take it home. So there are little keychains and pens and so forth, but there's also our 30th anniversary print edition of the FreeBSD Journal, as I mentioned yesterday during uh, my talk with Justin. I'd really recommend getting one of those. You can take uh, multiple if you want to hand it to folks at your office and so forth, um, but please take those. I think with that, I'll take this last chair off and hand it over to Gleb. Hello. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, hello, my name is Gleb Smirnov. Uh, I, I'm with FreeBSD as long as l I consider myself an adult person, a uh, committer for almost 20 years, and for the last almost 10 years, I'm working at Netflix Open Connect team um, where we use FreeBSD. So, a short introduction to what is Open Connect to those who are not uh, aware. It's a global CDN that creates a very large fraction of global traffic. And as a single application, we are basically the biggest source of traffic on the internet. Uh, power of, powered by thousands of uh, servers or appliances, as we call them, or caches. And they all run free busy. Um, and in this talk, I, I want to share our experience on how we ma maintain the modified FreeBSD fork uh, w in, in our team. And so, so this probably is the most loaded slide in my talk. And I ask you not to rush with reading it. <laughs> Better listen to me. <laughs> so uh, so the, the Open Connect started in 2012. And it was basically unmodified FreeBSD stable. Um, that had Nginx on it, and basically that's it. And that was the baseline that was able to serve uh, less than a half of a 10 gigabit interface. And um, Netflix, Open Connect together with Nginx, started to optimize that. Um, and in several years, um, yeah, very quickly we realized that most of the optimization should be done in the kernel. Uh, so in several years, uh, we were, uh, so we did jump to FreeBSD 10. Uh, we did a jump, uh, so we moved from one stable branch to other stable branch. I want to emphasize that. And we had basically two large patches to, to the kernel that provided us with increased performance, uh, which was a synchronous send file and VM page cache. And uh, here I got a red, red line. So what this, does this red line mean? It means that at this point we consciously realize that we are maintaining a FreeBSD fork. Because before that it was just like a natural process. Uh, okay, let's patch here, let's improve here and so on. But at that point we realized that we are going to maintain a FreeBSD fork and um, we did some radical changes uh, in the late of 2015, early 2016. So first, we moved to Git, uh, and FreeBSD was still on subversion. Second, we did our last jump. We jumped to FreeBSD current, because we don't want to do any more jumps. Uh, third, uh, which I'm going to talk later, instead of hacking in the FreeBSD directory, we embedded FreeBSD directory into our repo. So, so, so basically, FreeBSD became a subtree of a bigger repo instead of being uh, 
modified repo. So, so th this sounds like something obvious or trivial, but actually it's, it makes a lot of difference. It's make you to think differently about um, what, so, so when you say we built our operating system on top of FreeBSD, it's, a, it's actually you're including FreeBSD into your operating system. Uh, okay, uh, later on that. So um, in our, uh, in our uh, Netflix talks, we always boast about gigabits per second. So I could not resist without having the third column, uh, which boasts our uh, huge speeds that we are constantly increasing. And um, you don't need to read through all the details. It's just like the short descriptions of the patches. But overall, overall, the amount of code that we write increases, but the amount of our divergence from the upstream stays mostly constant and sometimes shrinks, but it definitely doesn't grow significantly. And this is what I want to talk about, how, how to do that. So um, I, I try to make the rest of the talk more abstract, talk less about Netflix. So we're, we will talk about some abstract vendor OS that uh, we'll, we want to build on top of FreeBSD. Uh, so we start basically with um, empty directory or s empty make file. <laughs> and I will not go into what you put in this make file, uh, but it's trivial. And then you use git subtree module to add FreeBSD as a subtree inside your, uh, inside the repo. This module will provide you the full history of FreeBSD and the exact commit hashes that the FreeBSD project uses. So you can refer to, to the commit hashes in the open source project. They will be the same in your project, uh, but living in a subtree. Uh, the alternative is git submodule, and I strongly recommend not using it. And I, I don't want to go into detail right now, but just trust me. <laughs> um, and from that point, you start developing. You hack outside of FreeBSD directory. You also hack inside FreeBSD directory, which means modifying your FreeBSD, making a fork. And there is code flow. So there is a code flow in two directions. There is a code flow that brings uh, new FreeBSD updates to your uh, operating system. And there is the opposite code flow. So l let's first talk about the code that comes from the open source community to you. So I want to divide it into two categories. Uh, the one is obvious, it's regular merges. Uh, how regular? Uh, I want to touch the topic later, uh, but uh, in short, as regular as you can do in your particular workflow. At Netflix, we do it roughly monthly. So the other thing is, taking code from the open source community that haven't even been committed to FreeBSD main. Why would you want to do that? Uh, so two reasons. Uh, some projects that you really want to use earlier than they get into FreeBSD main because you anticipate them to, pro to give you extra performance. So for example, um, on the previous slide I mentioned VM page cache. So we started to use VM page cache long before it hit FreeBSD current. We, we started to use uh, unmapped I.O. before FreeBSD current started to use it. So th this is what I called early adoption. And also, uh, you should do the same, not only for the changes that you anticipate to give you something, uh, so, some good improvements, and also for the changes that you expect to bring you degradations. So to give you an example, um, uh, recently, in FreeBSD, we switched it from OpenSL1 to OpenSL3. And at Netflix, we were afraid that this is going to, to, to make some breakages for us. Uh, so uh, instead of waiting for the OpenSL3 to hit FreeBSD main, we took it before, tested that, reported back to community, and uh, uh, so neutralized our fears about this upcoming change. So imagine from FreeBSD is uh, pretty straightforward. So because previously you added uh, subtree of FreeBSD, all following merges should also go through the subtree module. And this is how it looks like. So you create a project branch, and uh, in this project branch you do subtree merge. Uh, 
Uh, of course, it, uh, as long as your code diverges, it re create conflicts, you need to resolve these conflicts. What next? Uh, the answer is obvious, test. If you, if you are using FreeBSD current, of course you want to test. Uh, this actually applies to any stable system too. <laughs> uh, so the testing uh, I categorize into two different uh, things and both are uh, very important. So one is A-B testing, which means that we test our branch that includes fresh merger FreeBSD against the branching point. And, um, the, uh, and we check that they behave exactly the same performance-wise uh, and all, all kinds of metrics-wise there should be the same or better. Or maybe worse, but you expected this worse and you can accept that. But at least you need to be aware of what has changed. Uh, the other thing is uh, the unit tests that are running by continuous integration. Um, and this includes uh, the, the tests that are included in FreeBSD. And you should still run them, uh, despite the FreeBSD projects run them. You also should run them because your kernel configuration is probably different to what FreeBSD tests. Uh, so FreeBSD tests just generic. Your kernel is different. Your kernel is, it has different config. It, it has um, it has your own patches, so it, there, there can be a regression that didn't happen upstream, but it happens in your tree. And of course, as you develop new functionality in your fork of FreeBSD, you want to add your own tests on top of the FreeBSD tests. Uh, now let's um, uh, take a more detailed look at A-B testing. So A-B testing should be done uh, in an environment as close to production as you can do. Uh, at Netflix, we are um, pretty happy about that developers, uh, so because our production gives us opportunity to test in a real production. Uh, so b b the, whole, the whole CDN is built so reliably that you can literally panic a box uh, without disruption of clients. Uh, I understand that not everybody, not every company can provide such testing grounds. Uh, but uh, you should try to provide the testing grounds as close to the actual runtime as you can. Uh, then you need to make sure that the A, B, A and B parts of your test are exactly same, super exactly. Uh, 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 it's, it's, so for example, if, if you got a large set of data on your disks, if, if these disks were filled differently, it means that the data on the disk is uh, fragmented differently, which, make, which may make some artifacts in testing. Uh, and because um, sometimes you cannot do them absolutely the same, there is another uh, trick. So you do A-B test, then you swap the parts. So basically you, you, you run the, the merge branch on A and the master branch on B, and then you do the opposite and compare the results. Uh, you need to test across all supported uh, configurations that you do. Your newer box, your previous generation box, and your end of uh, support box. And uh, as you aggregate the metrics in some graph system, uh, you should not aggregate results from different hardware revisions because uh, there can be a change that improves performance on one generation of boxes, degrees, uh, degrades on the others. If you sum them up, there is no change. <laughs> uh, and when we talk about what metrics you should monitor, as much as you can imagine. Uh, so, at, uh, so there are obvious things like the traffic, the CPU usage. Uh, in our Netflix case, we look for uh, device reported errors, which means the, the TV screens or smartphones that watch Netflix, they report, hey, I had had so many issues with uh, low buffer or has so many issues with that. So, so everything that is uh, crucial to your business, you should pu put it into monitoring and A-B test should check that. Uh, so here is just an example of A-B testing that looks just fine. And that's a very trivial uh, metric. It's a uh, network interface output and looks like the lines are pretty much the same. So that's, that's a pass. The test has passed. So here's another example where we see that definitely there is a difference. 
Uh, does it mean it is a regression? Not necessarily, maybe that was part of the plan, but we need to be aware that something has changed. And uh, as an example, I took pretty exotic metric. So we are dividing uh, gigabits per watts, which after reducing the seconds ends in bits per joule. So how many bits per joule we, uh, we spent, uh, so how many bits we can send per joule of energy spent. Um, so here in the audience there is David, who is our wizard of A-B testing. And uh, this topic of A-B testing, it deserves another one hour lecture, how to do it properly. So you can ask David a questions on A-B testing. And uh, yeah, one thing I didn't mention that you should automate analyzation, uh, anal analysis of uh, A-B test result, but also you need a non-artificial intelligence to look at the result. You need some person to look at the results and uh, say that, yeah, looks, lo looks like we, we passed the test. So if something goes wrong with your testing, uh, you got two options. You basically go through the commit logs, you look through the diffs, and you find what caused the regression. Or you can run git, bis git bisect. Uh, in any way, uh, you find the offending change that created a regression, and again, you got two options. Uh, you can fix it yourself, or you can get in touch with the person who did the regression. And uh, the more often you do the merge, the easier is the second option, uh, because the code is fresh, uh, the, the person is still working in this area, um, and usually uh, the person will be quite grateful for, for the bug report on, on the freshly committed code. And, and of course, this fix yourself and contact the author, these two things can be combined. You can, work, you can work with the developer together. And then you test the game. So, so, so once the regressions discovered are fixed, you test the game. And everything is ok, uh, then the answer is trivial. You, you, merge, you, merge, you merge the merge branch to your main branch. Um, and now let's talk about uh, the, the other mm, category of code flow from open source to your project, which I ca co earlier called early adoption. So be it a feature that you anticipate as a good improvement or be it a feature that you fear, the technique is pretty much the same. Uh, you want the developer who works on this feature uh, share their code in some repo. Maybe GitHub, maybe some private trip about you need access to it. Then you just fetch his branch, and again you run subtree merge, Sa same command you would run with uh, the normal FreeBSD merge, but you merge now not from the FreeBSD main, you merge from this developer branch. One important footnote. Uh, you need to make sure that uh, this developer, that they synchronize to the FreeBSD main at the same points as you synchronize. Because if, they, if their branch is ahead of FreeBSD main, it means that with this merge, you will pull not only their changes, you will also pull fresh FreeBSD. Uh, it is unlikely, but if there are changes behind your, uh, behind your synth point with FreeBSD, it most likely will merge fine, but you'll be testing uh, something different to what uh, later will happen. So, so that's... One important thing. Uh, so, so this is a real, so this example is not just typing out, out my head, it's a real example. That was Pierre, who was, uh, Horben is his login name, who was leading the OpenSL import. And uh, we contact, get, get in touch with him. We said that we're concerned about OpenSL 3, so we'll be testing it. Can you please synchronize to this FreeBSD hash? We did that, we ran a B-test, we got the results, and and People in the community are usually grateful that it, it, so it doesn't look like you are stopping them, uh, like you are putting a bar saying that, please don't commit it to FreeBSD main before Netflix says good. No, it doesn't look like that. It looks different. Uh, it, for the people, that, they, are, they, are, they are glad that somebody tests their work and th that makes them more confident with finally committing to main because they, they can put a tag tested by Netflix. Uh, so this early adoption is very much recommended. And uh, yeah, obviously you need to test. Uh, so once you're 
satisfied with the results, there could be the, the code flow can go in two directions. So the feature is committed to FreeBSD first, and then you just merge FreeBSD main. Or if you are looking forward into this uh, cool performance improvement, as my early example of VM page cache, you commit it to your operating system first. And then months later, it gets into FreeBSD. And if, every, if the patches were exactly the same, you got a new merge. If they were not exactly the same, you will get some minor conflicts that probably you will be able to resolve. Uh, and now let's talk about the code flow in the opposite direction. Because, uh, you want to reduce the divergence of your operating system to FreeBSD, and that means that you need to upstream your changes. Uh, and, uh, and you cannot do this through an, an anonymous GitHub. That means that you need to find a person who will do that. Uh, so the options are uh, pretty simple. You hire a person who is a committer. You work with a community, uh, which usually ends up in a committer <laughs> in your company. Uh, but anyway, th this requires time. So, so, so th there should be a paid person in your company who spends time on upstreaming things. Or you can contract Clara <laughs> or maybe some other company who will do that work for you. Um, I'm very grateful for uh, yesterday Alan's, um, uh, Alan's talk about upstream first because he did a very good uh, uh, explanation of why spending this uh, developer time actually pays out in the future. Uh, why upstream first? Uh, because that's reduced the technical depth. And um, <clears throat> I, I'm not going to repeat him. Very, very good that he did the talk. So um, the code that flows from your uh, fork to FreeBSD can be categorized into uh, several categories. So the trivial ones are that are bug fixes because every open source project is glad to fi fix reported bugs. And um, uh, the code that basically doesn't change many lines, that adds some lines. This is also usually easily upstreamable well, un unless the code is super bad. <laughs> and the non-trivial code is that the code it changes lots of lines. And uh, I, I split it into demanded changes. And with demanded, I mean that uh, the other people will appreciate the, this code added to FreeBSD. So for example, FreeBSD is lacking some functionality. The other operating system will already have it. The FreeBSD is lagging behind. And you come with this code. The project usually is glad to accept it. Or uh, some performance optimization, because everybody loves performance optimizations. Uh, so when you come with this code, it's, uh, uh, there is less friction with uh, getting it in. But it's still uh, complex, because it changes lots of lines, requires reviews, and so on. Uh, refactoring and cleanups, uh, which uh, sometimes uh, mm, uh, they, they precede the other important changes. So, so be, bef before submitting some meaningful change, which goes to the demanded change category or bug fix, you want some cleanup. And finally, there are experimental ideas, uh, which is something that the community doesn't understand uh, why you want to add this to FreeBSD. Why is it useful? Why it is a good idea to have that in the repo? And as Alan said, upstream first, this applies, in, in my opinion, this applies to everything except the last. Please do not upstream first your experimental ideas. Uh, because we have had uh, experience of code appearing in FreeBSD, which a year after is known not to work anywhere. I mean, there is no company, there is no user who utilizes this code. It sits in FreeBSD. Uh, it needs to be compilable. Uh, people who do changes, they need to take care of this code to keep it compilable. Uh, there are some users who may look at it and try it out, but it doesn't work any longer. It's just compilable. So it's, uh, it actually, in several years after, an abandoned experimental idea slows down the project. Uh, it also 
reduces your karma as a code submitter. So ne next time, it will be more difficult to submit code. Uh, so everything that Alan said is correct, except experimental ideas. Uh, but you still, if, if you're going forward with your ideas, you actually, uh, everything starts with experimental idea. Not, not, nothing starts with uh, established idea. So how, how to do them correct? Uh, so there are two ways. So one is a trivial one. So you, you take your vendor OS, you make a branch, and you start hacking. Um, this, this immediately creates some diversions from FreeBSD, which um, later, uh, if, if the idea pans out, it's good. You need to go around all the, you, need to, you need, basically need to run recursive diff, uh, find all the places of diff that belong to this idea, carefully connect them together and, and submit a patch. Or if the idea doesn't pan out, uh, you need to remove them from your tree. Or you, you, you may forget to remove them from your tree and remove it years later with more friction. <laughs> but uh, still, this way actually sometimes work. Uh, I'll get later when it works. So the other way is that you branch a crazy idea in a separate repo, which is a FreeBSD repo, not your vendor OS repo. So in a FreeBSD repo, you branch a new branch that will be called your crazy idea. And then you establish the same workflow that happens with the early adoption. Uh, so this is the same that was in, in the open cell example, but now it's a graphical representation of that that will help you to understand what's going on. So you dump your crazy idea out of your brain to your branch. And this branch is a FreeBC branch. And then you do subtree merges to, to a branch in a different wrapper. So you run two, two wrappers at the same time. Um, this immediately creates a little bit of friction for every commit. Uh, that means that you first commit to, to one repo and then you immediately sub merge to the other. So like you need to run two, co two commands at a time. But uh, this tiny friction at your development time results in a big time savings when you're done. So when you're done, you have uh, a separate branch that has all your crazy idea done, complete, and ready for submission to FreeBSD. And now you can upstream first. Or not upstream first. You can, in parallel, put it in your repo and then FreeBSD, or vice versa. And because this development can take months and months and months, uh, and uh, the vendor OS goes forward, there are changes from your colleagues, you run merges, uh, you run merges from vendor OS to your branch. And because FreeBSD also goes forward, you run subtree merges from FreeBSD to your vendor OS main, and you run regular merges to your crazy idea branch. And here you see a small footnote, and it is exactly the same footnote as was uh, with the early adoption example. You need to make sure that you merge the same hashes from FreeBSD to, to, to two uh, branches. So when you're done, uh, yeah, so basically this, uh, the, this was the graphical representation of the workflow, and this is the command line representation of workflow. So uh, everything that was on the previous slide typed is, as, a, as a code. And during the, uh, during the process, you can share your idea with the community without any risk to leak company private data, because the idea lives in a repo that is forked of FreeBSD. It's not fork of your vendor OS. So you can, uh, at the same time, share it to GitHub and merge to your internal repo. And um, you can create FreeBSD reviews on Fabricator with, with the same command line. Uh, and th th this allows, so this workflow allows you to, sh to share your ideas with the outside community and your internal colleagues at the same time. Uh, so now let's touch the topic that a code flow that doesn't happen. So apparently if we talk about the FreeBSD fork uh, of uh, your OS, it means that there actually will be some divergence. Because if there is zero divergence, it's not a fork. Uh, some diffs will remain. 
uh, some deals will remain. Uh, so uh, apparently, this is some intellectual property that you don't want to share with, with the big world. Uh, uh, at Netflix, we are happy that we don't have any because all our intellectual property lives in Hollywood. Uh, in <laughs> In FreeBSD, we share everything. So that makes our life easier. I'm sorry, it doesn't apply to everyone. The other reason is uh, a code that has zero value to the, to the outside world. So basically, it is so specific to your project that there is no point in sharing it, and the project will not accept it. There may be other reasons, um, but anyway, there will be code not to be shared. So how to deal with it? So first, plan ahead. So when you change to FreeBSD sub three and start editing files, immediately decide to what category this code falls. Is it going to be upstreamable at some point? Or it definitely is not going to be. So when you start some editing, just clearly tell yourself, this is going to be upstreamed. Or no, this is not going to be upstreamed. And this actually uh, affects on how you hack with it. So if we uh, go with upstreamable code, everything said before. If we go with non-upstreamable code, these are uh, the best practices that we have. So if it is a userland application, do not drop it into FreeBSD user bin. Create a port for it. If it is a kernel, try to modularize it, isolate it as much as you can. If very likely the module infrastructure, which allows you to create syscalls, device drivers, will not be enough for you. Uh, so you need to, uh, to provide some isolation level that you will upstream, and then uh, use this KBI as a gate between your shareable code and non-shareable code. So um, to give an example is Netflix provided the pluggable TCP stacks. So we create a gateway between the, uh, the base TCP stack and then there are advanced TCP stacks. There is a structure that describes them and now you can make your own TCP stacks without editing any code in sys net. Uh, I, I, know, I know that Juniper does the same for the whole stack. Uh, so so th this is how it should be done. And once you, ha once you have these diffs, uh, learn them and know about them. So, so that any divergence point should be known. You should know why it exists, uh, who is the author internally in your company, who maintains it, uh, why it is useful. Maybe it is no, no longer useful. Maybe you can drop it. Maybe you're no longer needed. So, document your divergence from, from the upstream FreeBSD um, and monitor it. So, you know, we just sometimes, w once half a year, we just d run recursive diff and look w w w what divergence we accumulated for no good reasons. And, and then we say, okay, let's, let's upstream that. Uh, let's drop that. Let's refactor and upstream that. So, uh, Reduce the, tech, reduce the technical debt. Um, speaking of ports, I mentioned ports in the last slide. Um, I suggested that all your user land software should be written as a port. Uh, it's very likely that your vendor OS will use, uh, it is not very likely, it's, I'm 100% sure that your vendor OS will use some components that are not part of FreeBSD but are ports maybe Nginx, maybe um, Apache, maybe, well, d definitely. So how to deal with them? The collection right now of the ports is over 30,000, and you're, uh, you're going to be use a small fraction of them. Even if you use half a thousand, which is very unlikely, um, it's still a fraction. And they are running, uh, in the FreeBSD project, the ports as a single repo, so basically, uh, somebody changes some GTK component that you're not interested in, this is a new, new revision of main, of, port, of ports main. And the infrastructure of the ports, which is ports slash MK, is also embedded into the same repo. So, so the, 
the infrastructure and, and the ports themselves is, is just one repo. Uh, so how to deal with that? Uh, uh, maybe just import uh, all the ports as a subtree to the, the same way that we did with FreeBSD. Uh, so at Netflix, we skipped this step. <laughs> so we, we didn't go with this straightforward uh, decision because initially back in 2015, we had about 30 ports only. Maybe if we had 5,000, uh, sorry, 500, maybe we would go with this stupid step. But we skipped it. We went with uh, something that looked like a good idea back at the beginning. So, so basically, you, you grab a port and you commit it and um, Two months later, when you update the ports, you grab it again, uh, just copy it on top, and again you commit it. So uh, apparently you lose the history. Uh, also, it is very likely that you will have diversions in the ports too. It's very, very likely that you will uh, reduce some ports, like uh, reduce their functionality and so on. And the maintenance of these uh, divergence in ports becomes a headache. So basically, uh, with every ports update, you're constantly losing uh, data, and then you run like a small note, no, notepad.txt file where, when you merge ports, please don't forget about this diff. <laughs> so so it, it all becomes like, like pre-CDS times. <laughs> uh, but what, we, we have this stage. Uh, the next stage is called um, subtree split. So git subtree split, um, it belongs to the git subtree uh, subsystem, but it actually is uh, completely different functionality. For some reason, it lives in the same module. It, it does the opposite. Instead of adding a subtree with uh, history, with hashes, with, without changing hashes to your tree, it does the opposite. It goes through the history of some other tree, extracts all the commits that belong to certain path, and builds a new branch, apparently with new hashes, because uh, there is uh, uh, different data. But, but, it, but this branch has your path isolated, and it has history. Uh, so we used that for several years. Uh, it worked pretty good, but it had several issues. So first, the split process is super slow. So to go, so this is to go through the whole history of FreeBSD ports, it took three hours on a pretty uh, powerful box. And Git subtree split to, to, to split one to split one path, you, it needs to do a one run. So if you want to split uh, multiple ports, you need to run this process multiple times. And also, it stores metadata on the created branch that, it, that allows you to do a subsequent split. So, so, so first you split from the beginning of the history, and then you want, a uh, couple months later, you want to, to continue the splitting with more fresh commits. And it's to store metadata on the branch. And then it picks up, basically it had bugs. <laughs> it had bugs with this metadata, and combined with the super slow uh, super slow splitting, uh, we came to our own uh, script. So, uh, so this tool, and I highly recommend this tool to anybody who is going to run a small subset of ports, uh, does the following. So it does the same thing as subtree split, but it splits as many ports at one run as you want. So if you use 200 ports, it will split 200 branches at one run. So, so you spend three hours only once. Uh, it will not store metadata uh, anywhere in history. You need to uh, store it externally. So basically you write down my last, my last update. Uh, yeah, you need, you need to write down only one hash, which is not a big deal. So you, so you just, write down one hash, my last split ended here, and it means that next time I will restart my split from this hash. And, uh, and once you got all the, uh, all the ports, uh, port, port branches created with the history, you just git sub 3 add them, 
uh, to your repo. Or if you're doing update, you git subtree merge. Um, that uh, finalizes my uh, sharing of best uh, practice. And this practice was accumulated by a large team of people who work at Nectus, uh, who worked at Nectus before. Uh, these all their names. That this is how we accumulated all this experience. Uh, thanks to them. Thanks for you, to you for listening. Uh, if you got questions, I can answer them. Or I can briefly touch some topic that is strongly connected to this, but it's not a lecture on, it's not a best practice. It's more like a discussion point that I want to bring to the community. If you got questions, um, please ask, because it looks like I got about 15 minutes, which is good. So I don't see questions, so let's try your discussion okay. topic. Uh, so I want to suggest some change that um, came to my mind as I was doing the regular FreeBSD merges. Um, that, uh, so basically when we at Netflix run our FreeBSD merge and David does his excellent A-B testing, it ends up in a very good point in FreeBSD current. For us, for Netflix, it's just excellent point. <laughs> so uh, if some other people will synchronize with us in merging to FreeBSD, uh, merging from FreeBSD, that will create even more stable points. Uh, and then if we come to the community and say, you know, we have some, some schedule, some cadence of merging, let's synchronize your development cadence with our testing cadence. So for example, let's say that every last week of a month is a stabilization week, which means please do not drop your huge chunks of diff. Please focus on bug fixes. Uh, I'm not suggesting to make it a policy because I think in FreeBG project we are very good at making advices or gracious uh, wishes uh, instead of tools. So for example, we, we still do not require Fabricator to be run uh, for every commit, but we strongly recommend that. And I think it works pretty good. Uh, we, we do not force people for the certain format of the commit log, but 99% uh, follow this format. So, so this uh, stabilization week will not be a policy that will ban your commits, it will just a recommendation that, hey, we entered stabilization week. This is a very good week for you to update your desktop if you run FreeBSD current. This is a very good week to update your vendor OS if you work in, for some vendor. Um, this is a very good week to build a snapshot for the snapshots.freebsd.org. Uh, um, and the testing uh, that are done by different parties can be uh, run at the same time. So I think everybody will benefit from that. And we will have snapshots marked. So, so right now the snapshots are built in a pretty much automatic manner. So if the current builds, we got a snapshot. Uh, and now we'll have um, like community approved snapshots. A snapshot that, uh, that has, has been tested by several vendors and several people. Um, the release engineering can also use this, uh, well, we do not branch stable branch often, but we, we branch it every couple of years. And in my humble opinion, it's a disaster every time. So the release engineer wants to keep, to keep the people from touching FreeBSD current. And the people are trying to rush with as many changes to the FreeBSD current as they can, and that's create a conflict. And as John said before, the branching point doesn't need to be today's hash. It can be hash in the past. And this stabilization week um, hash, one of them, can be a good fork point for FreeBSD stable. Um, and this whole practice, it just will make developers, you know, a little bit more at planning. So if you have any input about that idea, 
um, you're welcome to speak out. I'll really appreciate. I, I see raised hands. So I, I like the idea, although if I'm, say, Netflix, I'm going to say, well, you know, it's going to be really stable at the end of the month, so that's when I ought to take it. And then, of course, you do your tests, and so you get your more stable one like a week after that instead of yeah, this doing is what all your testing, you know, in, in at the, the peak of it being at its worst state. Yes, so this is what happens. We start FreeBSD Immersion Monday. I cook a branch, uh, and, and if we are low on conflicts, I hand it to David Monday uh, evening. Uh, he, he starts to run tests, and by Tuesday, Wednesday, we got some uh, results. And sometimes we have regressions. And then we fix these regressions, work with community, and fix them by Friday. And usually, uh, because some more changes happened until Friday, we just cherry pick them. So instead of, instead of jumping from Monday to Friday, we just cherry pick uh, because it's more conservative approach. Sometimes, sometimes, if we had so many regressions that it's easier to, you know, to do a jump, we, we, we like uh, retry from scratch. But if that all happened in the stabilization week, so basically if between Monday, Friday, we do not anticipate breaking changes, then we will not cherry pick. We will just uh, commit the bug fixes, uh, or the person who, who helped us to fix them commits uh, these bug fixes, and then we remerge to Friday. Uh, and th 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 this is how it's going to be <laughs> in the ideal <laughs> uh, scenario. I guess something I like about this is that there's a bunch of things that are really awkward to test, like does the installer work, um, things yeah. like that. And I think having a clear window where you know we want to make sure that by Friday everything's good, that gives us an opportunity to seek volunteers to, for instance, you know, try out the installer on your favorite platform, make sure it. So basically, know, this adds another 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 right point way. to this list, right? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I know for Cherry BSD, one of our strategies is uh, we merge weeks at a time, um, and we pick Fridays as our starting point because people break crap over the weekend, and then it gets fixes during the week. So I, I like aligning on assuming that Fridays are kind of when we're probably no, no, no likely problem. to be a little better uh, stable. We, we, like I, I can do it on Friday, and then no, 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 actually. No, no, no. I mean, your, your schedule aligns with kind of our experience with how it works in yeah. FreeBSD. Is it people? commit things over the weekend that tend to be less stable than things that are committed midweek. Hmm. So that usually, usually the stability is like That's a bunch a of crap led Saturday morning and you're like, very oh, then they, you know, then by Monday very, they're not very, fixing very, it all. Very interesting <laughs> observation. And then so by Friday, Fridays are a good stable point. So I, I think this will work well with how we already kind of function. Did you have a question? Maybe people Did drink more on weekends. <laughs> I think this would make an excellent um, panel session or discussion at um, future uh, summits and things as well. Um, one question I was thinking about is just what cadence, um, like whether it's monthly, every six weeks, um, bi-monthly, what, what cadence will work best uh, um, as, as a whole? So I'm thinking about monthly, but it doesn't mean that every vendor should go monthly. So. So, for example, we at Netflix will probably do it monthly, but somebody else can do it bi-monthly, just synchronized with us. Or somebody do it uh, quarterly, uh, but, ag but, ag so be but again, it will fall on the same week. I mean, I think the point about monthly, too, is there's, there's the vendors, there's one side of the equation who are pulling and are hoping to have this stable point to pull from, um, and then there's I'll say this, training our developers to get used to this kind of schedule and basically just don't dump your experimental crap during the last week of the month. Really, that's what I think this boils down to in, in the single sentence form. I say don't, 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 don't dump your experimental crap. But. Well, I like your earlier point about, <laughs> I, I said it on IRC, which is don't dump and then abandon your experimental crap <laughs> full stop. Like that's, that is definitely a, a very true point and one that we have some scars from. So does anyone else have questions, by the way? Yeah, I see Pavel. 
I think this is similar to what uh, Kirk said, but uh, uh, I like the idea because it's, it's <laughs> I had this problem with my laptop all the time, but uh, uh, I'm sure you also like uh, with cherry picking, right? You, you t take a, a, a specific hash and then you realize, okay, there are some bugs that were fixed in like two weeks or something like that. So you just cherry pick because you don't want to slide uh, two weeks of changes, right, forward. Uh, but I uh, also wonder if uh, if you just give one week for this stabilization period, if it, it not, if people uh, wouldn't want to wait for this week to do some like upgrades on the laptop, so basically you, you won't get any testing within those three weeks where the changes were made and everyone just uh, upgrades uh, on the last week and then they report the bugs. So before the fixes goes in, we already in the next period, so. Uh, so you're suggesting a, a short-lived branch? Uh, to be honest, I have no suggestion. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like uh, thinking out loud. Uh, yeah, uh, branching in Git is cheap. We can create a short-lived stabilization branch. Because for example, what, what we do, uh, we, when we release and we uh, provide our upgrades uh, for our product to the customers, those can live for many months and customers would prefer not to upgrade because for example, it just works. Uh, so we don't have this luxury as Netflix, but, uh, but what we do when we test, we, we, uh, we split the testing into like uh, the stabilization period uh, and then you have, so for example, in this, uh, in this scenario, you will have like uh, second to last week of every month you stop dumping experimental changes, we stabilize, but there is also, and people can uh, start like upgrading, testing and stuff like that, and the last week, uh, all the f we try to so get all the fixes in, right? So at the end of the month, we have like a s pretty stable current. Uh, but uh, this just complicates the whole process. <laughs> I, that's not a suggestion, just. Well, I think to your point, Pavel, you're, you're worried about people being lazy, which is a common, I'm not, I always have similar worries. I think we would have to strongly encourage our developers to make this work, you need to actually test at the beginning and not wait for everyone else to fix all the bugs for you. You have to be participatory. So everyone would have to be on board with the fact that when we hit the don't dump your crap in the tree week, um, at the start of that, everyone needs to actually upgrade their laptops and suffer through the week jointly. Um, so that we then fix it during the week. Because I think that's what makes this work, is we all have to be testing during the week to fix during the week. So I do, I do think it's important that, I, mean, I, I like the idea of imposing restraint for a period, and you know, a week a month seems good to me. I feel like any more than that would be really a problem. Yeah, I think the duty cycle, duty cycle of business as usual needs to be at least 75%, maybe higher. It might, I mean, I might say like the five days of the last yeah. week of the month is your period. And like, you know, people should expect to get whacked if they <laughs> commit garbage on Sunday, but <laughs> um, you know, if they rush something in. But you know, I, I think like it needs to be business as usual the majority of the time. Yeah, we don't want to. And business as usual is quite We, we don't want to days. slow down the developers uh, strongly. Yeah, I agree. I, th I think Brooks is right. And I guess what I was trying to say to, to Pavel, I don't know that a technical solution like more branches is how we should solve this. I think it's a social problem the, with just uh, educating our developer community about we want to do this and this is how, this is the rules everyone kind of needs to, or the, the guidelines. I think you're right about that too, but the guidelines are pretty good with dealing with reasonable guidelines that we want everyone to follow to make this work. And I, I think if we pitch it that way, I think it's something we can sell and that will probably work. Yeah, uh, oh, so, 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 one, one second. Uh, so, so some tooling I actually uh, think should be useful. So for example, a Google Calendar that just automatically, automatically fills all, all these days so that everybody can export this calendar to their calendar and see that. And probably a script that will maybe create a branch, maybe not create a branch, but send the email like, hey, this hash, is the hash we recommend you to start your stabilization cycle. Pavel has comment. Uh, 
so uh, what we also do is we, we are trying to eat our own dog food. So like before we release any version, we will deploy it in our production environment because we use our products as well. So uh, if we could get someone from uh, infrastructure team to be able to like do the upgrades uh, uh, at the start of this week, yep, and then we could test on our infrastructure. That would, yep. be, of course, I'm not volunteering, just to be clear, but uh, <laughs> uh, but that would help a lot, I'm sure, uh, if we could start like. Uh, once we start this uh, stabilization period, we upgrade uh, the yeah. cluster and uh, and then we can find probably more bugs. Yeah, we can promote that we at FreeBSD run at our own FreeBSD current stabilization points and we recommend you to run your laptop the same way. <laughs> so one thing I would really like to see is more um, automation and uh, like test gates that can promote an image, say, through various stages, um, so that we could, uh, as an end user or developer building something downstream on FreeBSD, I would like to be able to say, I want the most recent hash that has gone through some level of, um, of testing. So like, I know that it boots, or I know that package set exists for it, or I know that the compiler works. Um, and so I mean, we can get into this discussion um, later on about technical uh, technical solutions to this. I mean, whether a branch is the right way to go or, or not, all that I think are, are implementation details that we'll need to work out. But I think there is, I have a, ver a very strong interest in being able to have sort of those level of, of gates and I think we need some way to be able to say, you know, that if a, if a, if a change does arrive that kind of causes a big regression, we really do want to be able to get, you know, either productizing or whatever it is, the cherry picking and such that you, you use internally during the week if there's a problem. We want to be able to share that across multiple uh, consumers. So I think Pavel and Gleb are just going to talk for a while during our break, and I'm feeling. I have to fight with this every day, so. Uh, uh, but uh, automation, I think, is also the key uh, to make this success, because one week or five days is really, uh, of course, we want to make it uh, short, but it's also short to test and report bugs and fix uh, during this week. But uh, maybe we do that, I, I don't know. But if we could extend like testing, not only to use our test suites, but also to like uh, select some ports that have test suites, like for example, PostgreSQL or hmm. Engine, Nginx, and we do that? Or, or LLVM, yeah, yeah. So basically, as much as we can throw at this uh, change at the beginning of this stabilization week, the better, right? Because yeah. uh, not just our test suite, but as many others as possible. Any other questions? I think, yes, I think we're at just, about Just it. in time. Say what? Just in time. <laughs> oh, yeah. So I think we're good on time. Um, so I think we have our first break for the day. So thank you, Gleb. Thank you very much. And let's see. I think we're, I'll, let me check to see how long it is. Half hour? All right. So we can talk more during the break. Thanks.
Okay, folks. <coughs> We're ready to get back started again. Um, our next talk today um, is from Andy Waffle from ARM. So I'll hand it over to Andy. Yeah, thanks, John. Um, so, aloha, welcome. Uh, so, as John said, I'm Andy Waffa. I am a lobotomized engineer uh, at ARM. Um, do not trust any code you see from me uh, if it's within the last mm, 10 years. Uh, it's not safe. Uh, so, um, ARM and the uh, Damon, um, how have we realized FreeBSD's value uh, in the real world. So, a little bit of history. Uh, I've been with ARM now for 12 years. Um, and kind of as soon as I landed at ARM, one of the first things I took on was engaging the FreeBSD community. Up until that point, I knew about FreeBSD, never interacted with the community or um, any aspect of the software in any shape or form. So, can anyone tell me what this is? No? Nope. It's the ARM1 processor uh, evaluation board that was going into the BBC Micro. So that's where it all started. So I've, I've kind of gone back a little bit too far. So this is as far as back as I want to go from a history perspective, right? Uh, AR64, uh, what is it? It's a 64-bit um, architecture from ARM, clean slate, ground up uh, design. Um, and this was, this is the future of uh, computing. Um, it's going to power everything. Uh, for the most part, we're getting there. Um, so as part of the uh, ARM V8, uh, initiative of making sure that software around the world supported the architecture well. Um, I was tasked with work with FreeBSD, get um, get that well supported. Great. How difficult can it be? Partnered up with Cavium uh, with their ThunderX platform um, and. We collaborated in funding foundation to work with uh, the community uh, to get uh, ARMv8 support into FreeBSD. Uh, and yeah, we kind of we got there for the most part. Not quite feature parity with Linux, but uh, it was definitely a usable platform. We uh, worked with uh, members in the community. We worked with. Uh, contract houses to get the work done. It was all great. ThunderX wasn't necessarily the best platform, um, but it, it kind of did the job. Um, so that's all good. Why, why are we spending time, money, effort, manpower in, in doing this? First one is balance. Um, there's no yin without yang. Good, evil, etc. right? Linux, FreeBSD. I'll let people choose which one's good and evil and yin and yang, but that's not my choice, right? Um, so one of the things when we did, uh, when we first came out with ARMv8 was um, making sure that there was uh, an even keel there we wanted FreeBSD and Linux uh, to be available to one and all. Um, we also wanted to make sure that the guys and gals in the Linux community didn't get too cocky and too dominant. Right? We wanted to ensure that um, they were kept on their toes, they didn't get all comfortable and go, hey, it's fine, we're the only open source operating system out there, whatever. So we wanted to make sure that FreeBSD was always there as an option. And crucially, choice, right? Um, with the MBA architecture, we had a huge raft of uh, silicon vendors that came out uh, and were providing uh, different implementations. 
Um, and so to go with the hardware choice, we wanted people to have a choice from a software perspective, right? Um, from middleware, you've already got, you can choose this, that, or the next thing. Operating system, we want people to be able to choose um, whatever OS they want. If they wanted a proprietary one, Merry Christmas, go to Microsoft or whomever. If you wanted an open source platform, well, you've got a choice of two. You can either go Linux or you can go for EBSD. So that's kind of why we were getting engaged with FreeBSD, et cetera. So how do we use FreeBSD in the arm? Does anyone recognize one of these? Right. Good old fashioned um, network appliance, I believe it's uh, seven, uh, 7340 or something along those lines. It's an old one. Anyway, we're a NetApp customer. Right? We've got lots of NetApp devices um, within our infrastructure, and nobody knows. All what they know is their storage. Great. But as we all know, a lot of these NetApp platforms are powered by FreeBSD, so we're a FreeBSD user in that respect. As Brooks mentioned, there's Cherry. Uh, and Amarello, more to the point. Uh, and for those that don't register the connection, Morello is a type of cherry. Yeah, we all like the puns. Anyway, so we have quite a few of our uh, Morello uh, architects, etc., actually working on and with FreeBSD, working with the community. This is a photo of Andrew Turner's desk at Cambridge. Um, well, not quite. I think that's a bit tidy, I think. Um, but yeah, so we use FreeBSD, um, and this may irk um, Gleb and, and John, etc. as a bit of a lab kind of thing. Um, Reason for that, um, we'll get to in a second, but it's a, it's a great platform for people like us uh, and other uh, commercial entities to work with, right? There's the number of university courses on operating systems built around FreeBSD for a reason, right? It's a great platform to do a lot of research type work, um, to actually get stuff done. So one of the reasons we like working with FreeBSD in that lab scenario is getting code into FreeBSD is pretty easy in comparison to, this is one of the cleaner diagrams of getting your code into the Linux kernel, right? So with FreeBSD, pretty flat. You break it, you fix it. And you'll soon find out if you break it because somebody's going to shout at you, kick you, until you fix it, which is great. So we use FreeBSD, uh, and when I say we use, we have recently started to use FreeBSD in this manner of, OK, let's, we've got a feature we want to get landed in Linux, in FreeBSD. We're going to go with FreeBSD first. Why? It's easy to get in. Once it's in, we've got a good, solid operating system that we can test stuff on, make sure that this works in theory, in practice, and we can then take that code and take it over to Linux. We can't do it the other way around. Why? The licensing compatibilities. So, we love FreeBSD from this perspective, and we're going to be using FreeBSD much more to get more code landed. So the advantage of that is FreeBSD will soon have all the new shiny, shiny that we come up with. So if you want the new architectural features coming out of ARM, you need to be using FreeBSD. So what features are coming up, uh, and what stuff will you see in that respect. So, 
what Andrew's been quite busy uh, last uh, month or so doing has been Beehive. Um, so a lot of the cool Beehive stuff has now been upstreamed. Uh, he's been working on ensuring that uh, our SVE, so scalable vector extension support, has landed so you can get full benefit out of Graviton 3 um, and uh, implement SPE support. Coming up, you're going to have uh, more features for um, SPE. You've got uh, BTI uh, pieces from security perspective. You've got further Graviton 3 feature enablement. Um, and you've got additional SVE, RAS, RNG as part of that. Um, and so moving forward, more um, security enhancements. You're going to have uh, additional uh, vectorization support, SVE2. Um, and we've got some stuff that's further down the line uh, in the future. But all of this will be landing roughly uh, in these time frames, in these quarter time frames. And these are kind of geared around um, making sure, and with a lot of this stuff, actually, we've become feature parity uh, with Linux. So from a core architectural support perspective, what you get in FreeBSD is exactly what you're going to get in Linux. Right? There's no difference. There's no lag. We are going to be in lockstep moving forward. Um, so if you wonder why Andrew Turner's not responding or seems busy or whatever else, it's because he is busy. We're making sure he's earning his money. So um, that's all good and well. That's how we're using it. How we're using it, it you know, we've got one full-time engineer. So Mr. Turner is Mr. FreeBSD at ARM at the moment. We have a couple of others that know bits and bobs and can help out. Um, and actually, we find that, uh, so Andrew Turner is part of our core kernel team. That's predominantly Linux kernel engineers. But we actually find that there's a great collaborative uh, environment within the workspace there with that Linux guys, Mr. Turner, and the others that know a bit of BSD here and there, all just talking together. This kind of started in, in the pub, uh, as I mentioned yesterday. It's how they sort of shoot the breeze, bounce ideas, um, cry on each other's shoulders, you name it. One thing that I would love to see us do um, is grow that team. Um, I'm trying. Uh, I need more customers to be using FreeBSD, more people asking ARM for additional free, FreeBSD features, uh, raising bugs, etc. so that I've got that justification to go to management and say, look, we need more engineers. Um, we're looking at ways that we can actually um, expand our interactions with the community. Uh, how can we be better FreeBSD citizens um, moving forward? Because we actually value uh, what's happened in the past, uh, and we can see the value moving forward as well. Uh, and personally, I work in open source professionally for the last god knows how long. I do actually like this community quite a lot. Um, some quirks, but I think that's what makes it endearing, right? Um, but why do I want to grow the team? Uh, why do I want more involvement for EBSD? There's a few things coming down the line. Um, Ampere One's coming up real rapid. Um, NVIDIA with their Grace architecture. Um, so this is not just going to be um, high performance compute stuff. Um, this is going to be standard server based um, CPUs. It's going to be, uh, I don't believe it's going to be Grace, but NVIDIA have confirmed that they are entering the laptop market. Um, so you'll be able to get NVIDIA powered um, 
laptops, not just from a GPU perspective, but also from the CPU. Qualcomm recently announced their uh, Snapdragon X Elite uh, series. Um, AMD have also announced that they're re-entering the ARM market, uh, again, primarily around client-side devices. MediaTek, again, will also be going into the desktop and laptops very shortly. So there's a lot of new stuff that developers can get their hands on. This isn't even talking about what's going on in the IoT space and the embedded space and automotive, et cetera, right? Um, automotive, huge growth there for us. Uh, and so th there's a lot of opportunities there. Unfortunately, it's one segment that FreeBSD is not really well known for. Um, there are a few commercial companies in the automotive space that use quite a few chunks of FreeBSD, but it's not FreeBSD. QNX is an example. Um, they use a lot uh, of components from FreeBSD in their platform. But yeah, so th there's a lot happening. Uh, we've got the gaming side of things as well, so there's opportunities there. Uh, so I, I really want to make sure that with all this new stuff that's coming down the line, you guys and gals have all the tools available to you to be able to benefit from it, right? Um, so you can just, hopefully, Pavel won't have issues with his laptop uh, rebuilds because it's all done for him, so it's not a problem. Any issues, blame Andrew Turner. It's all good. Um, and so, yeah. That there's, I do have a request, though, as to what can the community here do to help, right? We want to help you help us to help you kind of thing. So we've got um, a new developer program. It's about a year old now. Um, we would love for you guys and gals to join, help participate, make it uh, better. Um, we've also got learning paths, so for uh, documentation and how-tos, etc. These are very specific on a variety of different uh, platforms uh, and areas. So that, that's kind of how we're moving forward, and, and these are areas where you know you can help contribute uh, very arm-specific pieces, uh, and that all makes everyone that much better. Uh, and we've got our developer hub as well. Uh, so we're trying to make sure that developer ecosystem have the tools that they need uh, to be able to uh, move forward. So kind of, that's all my slides. I wanted it to be a bit more conversational uh, kind of thing. So that's, you've got the background of how we're doing it, how we want to do things, how we want to move forward. Uh, so, any questions? Um, one of the really cool things about ARM is the fact that you guys uh, maintain tight control over the architecture and when SOC vendors want to use ARM, they basically have to agree to do the whole architecture correctly so we don't have the disaster that MIPS became. That's the, the good side. Um, as I mentioned yesterday, and I think I saw a lot of heads nodding, one of the major barriers we as embedded vendors face is when trying to use any of those SOCs, it's not the arm bits that give us grief, it's all the stuff around it. Um, if you guys could do whatever you can to encourage, require whatever those SOC vendors to either one, document their crap, or B, um, dual license their any drivers that they provide so that they would actually be usable to those of us who don't want to buy into the GPL virus. Um, that would be enormously helpful to the industry. Yeah. Um we are trying to be as politely forceful as we can uh, with uh, our uh, customers and partners. The, when it comes to the driver side of things, uh, it does 
get trickier, um, but I, I fully hear and understand your pain, uh, and it is something that is pretty high up on our list because when we come up with all our architectural designs and ideas and whatever else, we need to test it, right? So we create test platforms for us to fiddle with and, and run code on, make sure. A lot of the time we'll need said vendor's drivers. Uh, and quite often we run into issues and so we try and get that fixed. We do try and push them in the right direction. It's not always easy. Um, and if we've got people like yourselves also going, hang on, this does not work. What do we do kind of thing? It makes things a little bit easier there as well. But yeah. So uh, two questions. So uh, first of all, is uh, ARM going to try to go head to head with, with Intel at the, the high end uh, server space? Um, I wouldn't say we're gonna try. I think we've already committed to doing that. Um, so we, as ARM, we're, we're an IP company, right? We don't make anything. We come up with ideas and we license our ideas to other people to do it. So people like Ampere, AWS, Google, Microsoft, they've all committed to doing high performance compute. Uh, and so that's as it is now. I mean, if you, get a, if you go to AWS and you request a, an instance, the default is you get Graviton. The default is you get ARM, right? Uh, and all the cloud vendors are doing that now. Um, I think Microsoft is the last one to come online. Okay, uh, yeah, second question. Um, so 30 years ago, the, the MIPS 64-bit uh, architecture was absolutely the thing. And, you know, we were at, I was at Citrix at the time, I'm sorry, Cisco at the time, and we, uh, you know, we used that to, to great benefit. But of course, it's, it's, Intel has cubic money to, to develop their, uh, shall we say, uh, very complex architecture, so it, it's hard to compete. So uh, bottom line is, is, is if somebody's con committing to an architecture long term, um, you know, what guarantees can, can they have that, that uh, ARM will stay competitive? Um, we, so our history's in the mobile space, right? Even though we started off in BBC Micro, our cash cow has been mobile side of things, right? And we've had, various architectures come and go in the mobile space, we've been consistent, right? Um, we are looking at doing exactly the same in all the other uh, vertical markets, whether it be automotive, embedded IoT, uh, server, you name it, right? Um, and the, we've signed a long-term long commitment with the you know, various um, hardware vendors to ensure that they have longevity. Um, and so we, we, we still adhere to the annual tick from an architectural perspective. Uh, and so we're constantly coming out with new features, listening to the feedback from various hardware vendors, silicon vendors, who then listen to their customers, hopefully. Um, and so our commitment to ensuring that we have that is NVIDIA's not going anywhere. They've just made massive commitment to uh, compute with their Grace architecture. Um, the hyperscalers have signed deals. They're all running ARM now. Doesn't matter whether it's on the east or on the west. Um, they're all there. High performance compute space, uh, again, We've got new silicon vendors like Cypearl in Europe uh, and others that are, are entering the space. So I certainly hope that I'm able to retire whilst working at ARM. Um, so I've still got a few more years left on me. Uh, and so I, I'm hoping that that continues uh, to be the case. Thank you. I've got a question from Warner Losh from, from Netflix over IRC. So Warner asks, how can we engage with Errata better with ARM? 
He says, it took me quite a while to get information on the Git version 3 stuff when I needed to do workarounds for uh, Linux boot. So um, we do have a support um, mechanism for uh, getting the errata side of stuff. The, the shortcut would be reach out to me uh, and I can be the you know, the traffic cop and direct people into the right areas. It's kind of what I'm around for. Um, the, the aspects of getting some of the errata prior to it being published um, can be a bit confidential, whether, you know, things like the whole um, Spectre Meltdown side of things. That's a different set of problems. So. We have to wait for all of that, you know, the embargoes and all that sort of stuff to, to happen. And most people are aware of how that kind of thing works. But for, for the regular errata, you can open up a support ticket to get the relevant documentation or come to me uh, and I'll get the right people to, to get you the right docs. Um, our documentation can be overwhelming and a little bit confusing at times. Um, but we're, we're, we're getting there and we're coming out with new new tools and, and ways of being able to, to help work through it. Also then in regards to, to the um, embargo and stuff, is that something that we can work with maybe through the foundation to establish NDAs and yeah. contracts so through? Okay. We, we, we have a valid NDA with the foundation. Oh, okay, okay. So, I was uh, thinking we probably did, but I just wanted to Yeah, check. no, no we, we, we most certainly have um, about uh, NDA with the foundation, and we have worked. Uh, Ed and, and Andrew Turner are, are well plugged into things like you know when the the whole uh, Spectre meltdown thing came around and, and whatnot. So yeah, we, we we are like I say, we are now at a stage where FreeBSD is going to be in lockstep with Linux. So whatever happens in Linux is going to happen in FreeBSD at exactly the same time. Chances are FreeBSD will be that little bit ahead until the mass of uh, people that are working on Linux can then bring it back up in set. Any other questions? I think Greg's got a question back to Ah, sorry. <laughs> for, the, for the stream, Greg is cheering the prospect of FreeBSD being ahead. Okay, well, thank you very much, Andy. And so I think we have our second scheduled break of the morning, and we'll be back in a half hour-ish, I think at 11.45 is our next talk.
Okay, folks. Uh, why don't we go ahead and make our way to our seats? Um, we're going to start our next session a couple minutes early, just to give them a couple extra minutes. Um, so our next session is going to be a talk from the FreeBSD Foundation from both Anne and Ed. So I'll How about hand Deb? it up to Deb. Sorry. <laughs> wow. They're about three I need more coffee. Tea. <laughs> tea. I don't drink coffee. More tea. Um, Deb, please. So take Thank it away. You. Thank you, John. Um, hi, everyone. I know I've met a lot of people in here, and I hope to meet the people who I haven't met yet um, before the end of today. So I'm Deb Goodkin, and I'm the executive director of the FreeBSD Foundation. Um, we're the main sponsors of this event um, with, with NetApp. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, who we are and what we do and, and some of our plans going forward. And then I'm going to hand it off to Ed Mast, who is our senior, direct, senior director of technology. And he will um, talk about what we've been funding in the technology group, because over half of our, um, our funding goes towards that group. So, um, so I'll start a, a little bit about me. I wasn't going to do this, but when Andy was just talking, Andy from ARM, um, uh, it just it triggered something way back in the olden days for me when um, I was a firmware engineer doing, um, oh, you can see the little Slack thing, so hopefully that won't be um, distracting people. <laughs> um, I don't know how you don't have that happen, but anyway. Um, so, so I used to be a firmware engineer in the storage um, industry, and, um, and so we used ARM processors, and I always remember, like when we'd use a new processor than ARM, the ARM team would come, and we would have like days of getting trained on their processors, and we would go home with these like humongous manuals, and I actually still have some of them on my bookshelf at home, and so, uh, so when he talked about the documentation and in reference to something earlier, it just like triggered that memory. So, so anyway, so that's, that's my background. Um, first, I want to start out with a big thank you. I do want to thank NetApp for providing this venue. I think it's incredible. People have told me that they've been really pleased with the setup. Uh, we can spread out. It's, people are really comfortable. Uh, the food has been great, and, um, and I want to thank Ann Dickinson, who is our marketing director, for um, doing most of the organi organizing for this event um, in coordination with the other uh, folks on the uh, summit committee. We usually we meet weekly for all of the vendor and, and de developer summits that we put on throughout the, the year. Um, and then I, I really want to just thank everyone here. You are users of FreeBSD, you're contributors in many different ways. And so thank you for coming, and really just thank you for everything that you do. So, but thank you, I mean really, uh, you know, we're a community, and so um, that leads me into this, this ecosystem that we like to share to show the different areas or components or parts of um, you know, our ecosystem, and it's from you know, the actual operating system, which we run on our computers or in our products or data centers. It's our community, it's us, it's the people who, who do all of this. And, um, and then it's the FreeBSD Foundation, and we're the ones who, um, we're a separate organization, we're actually a corporation, and our whole purpose is to support you and, um, and the project. And so um, yesterday, Greg, if you heard his talk, he had this quote in here, and he said, it's not the source code, it's the source of the code. And so I was thinking about that, and I was thinking, I actually changed it a little bit, and I said, it's this, this is the source of our product, because it's not just the code. It's FreeBSD is a product, and, um, and it's more than just code, it's documentation. And, and we're known for having really good documentation, um, advocacy that there's so many people out there advocating uh, for FreeBSD. So this is many ways that people contribute. So in this example, this is a developer summit in uh, Brussels, 
And, um, and so these folks are, some are committers, some are um, contribute source code and documentation and just different ways that they contribute. Um, collaboration, you have one, these two people, I don't know if you recognize them, um, the guy on the right is actually one of the original um, developers uh, or founders of Beehive and uh, and this was a conference in Australia that I was at, and um, I was just taken, a, sort of blown away by their relationship. And the the guy on the left is actually he was a he was like a newer he would refer to himself as a newer ports committer, and he was just sitting there just absorbing so much from Peter, and it was awesome to watch. They really enjoyed working um, together, teaching that. Uh, we hold workshops, and this workshop is, is pretty typical as far as this is in Southern California, and um, it was really a full room of people who were interested in learning about FreeBSD, and we had Roller who was actually teaching the workshop. We have people who advocate for FreeBSD by doing these fun and cool videos, and so I look at it as teaching as well as, as training and advocating for FreeBSD. So that's who we are. This is, this is how we contribute to FreeBSD. So who are we, the foundation? Well, we've um, been around since 2000, and uh, so for 23 years, so a very long time. Um, I've been with the foundation for 18 years, so I have been around uh, with them for since the, almost the very beginning. Um, we are a 501c3, and Greg explained the differences between a C uh, C3 and a C6 yesterday, and so we, our purpose is for the public good. We support the project, we do support commercial users, but we, hold, we support the whole ecosystem. Uh, we're based in Boulder, Colorado, so that's where I'm from, and our founder, he um, also lives in Boulder, and that's why we're based there. And, um, and we're also 100% funded by donations, and so we always want to make sure people and, and companies understand that because all this work that we do, um, that's the only way that we can fund it. And we have a staff of like really passionate uh, people who are very connected to this community that I was talking about. So this is a little window into who we are. We're very small. I like to say we're, you know, we're small but mighty. I know I'm not the only one who's used this phrase, but we have folks on the team uh, this is our full-time staff, um, Ed, who's here, Caustic, I'm sure you've heard, he does a lot of the x86 um, software development work. Uh, Lauren Grakowski, who's in the back, who's our administration manager, you've probably dealt with her for uh, donations and travel grants and things like that. Uh, Pierre, who's uh, stepped in to do a lot of the user land work. And uh, Lee Wen, who does CI, and then uh, Joe, who's doing project management and just stepping in so many different areas uh, to support us. Drew Gorkowski, who's uh, doing a lot of our social media as well as writing how-to guides for getting new people to use FreeBSD. Um, and I mentioned her earlier, uh, who does um, um, all the advocacy work for us as well as organizing events like this. And then Greg, who you met yesterday when he gave his talk, he's new. Uh, he's one of the newest uh, people on our staff. And, um, and like he said, it's, um, since he's joined, it's been action-packed having him on staff, and it's been awesome. And when I say awesome, it's because we, so about a couple years ago, we really started growing, and uh, we brought Ed on board full-time, we brought on a few other uh, staff members full-time, and, um, and we've really viewed this as a step from being sort of a scrappy organization to you know, a much bigger organization that could really step in and support the project. Um, and now I see a different phase at where we're at. Who I have up here right now, uh, these are our board of directors. Uh, we do have a small team right now, and, but everyone brings in experience from all different areas, from uh, open source, uh, Andy, who just gave us talk, from the ARM perspective, as well as he's also involved in a lot of different op other open source projects. Uh, Justin Gibbs, who is our founder and also our president still, and um, who actually, um, he, he, hopefully you heard his talk yesterday, um, 
And since he's been at Meta, um, it's really opened his eyes to what we can do from the things that he's been exposed to, like uh, more modern tools and things like that. Hiroki's actually here uh, from Japan. And, um, and we have folks like academia, too, so, so all over the, the place. Um, so if you look at, I know this is a busy slide, these are really the areas that we support. And I'll just highlight each area. Um, and, and the idea, this is to give you an idea of, of what we do. And also to help you know to, um, you know, how we can help you too. Because really, you're, at, we're a nonprofit, you're our constituents. And, um, and so we are also looking for input from you on ways that we can help. Uh, previously as well as the project. And actually having a summit or event like this really helps inform what we do too. So starting at the top left, we do project development work. And this is, Ed will go into more detail. We do have a staff of software engineers. We have, um, I have not like 10, oh, I had it on the uh, previous slide. I think we have about 10 contractors right now that we work at, with. A lot of them just step in and fix bugs right away uh, so we can fix things quickly, they implement features, and um, they do uh, code reviews and, and all sorts of different support. Uh, we have two staff members on the security team, and um, I, it, it, every so often I see the little slack bubble go up, and so <laughs> for me it sort of cracks me up, but it, hopefully it's not a distraction uh, for you. I, could, I wonder if I should take a break. and restart this. I guess it, it's okay. Um, we do have two staff members on the security team, so, uh, so we do have resources available um, to make sure that, um, you know, errata goes out quickly and just people, folks are on top of it. We also have uh, Gordon, who's a security officer, who's actually here, um, basically contracted to under us. Um, uh, quality insurance, we have uh, Lee Wen, who's doing continuous integration as well as looking at ways to modernize and improve the testing uh, of the code. We do support the uh, infrastructure for UBSD, and so um, that's all managed by cluster admin, and, um, and so what we do is we have one person on staff who works with cluster admin to make sure that we are serving them with what they need. So we actually just spent $85,000 to um, upgrade uh, the ser uh, many of the servers in the infrastructure. Um, we also have one of our team members who's actually on Cluster Admin. So, um, so we're there to help with both um, with hands. We also pay for hands-on too at the, um, the co-location facilities. And helping with onboarding, this is an area that um, actually Ed will cover um, in his talk on what we're doing to try to smooth that out, make it more efficient. Um, advocacy is a big area that we do support, and that's from uh, giving presentations at conferences, that's from uh, providing um, market or um, content on presenting like the features of FreeBSD and why you should use FreeBSD, and, um, and some of actually the uh, slides that Greg shared with you yesterday and, um, and we really want to expand on that. Um, training and education is something we're working on. Um, I'm working on um, twisting Doors' arm right now from, um, <laughs> got his attention, uh, from Netscaler uh, and helping us with providing some um, educational material. Maybe I'll try to recruit um, Kurt too, so we'll see here. And then finally, um, we can represent the project um, as a, a legal entity, so that's signing NDAs and um, other types of legal engagements. So some of the areas that uh, we recognize are, that's really important, one is getting more young developers involved with FreeBSD. And so we've done it in, in many ways, but two key ways that, um, or areas that we're involved with, one is Google Summer of Code, um, and that has been a great program for us to get 
um, young people um, introduced to FreeBSD, as well as getting committers to our project. And so we've been part of this uh, program since the very beginning. And every year you have to apply, and we never know if we're gonna get accepted because they have a ton of applicants, and we do, and they really support what we do. Uh, and so here's just some of the, um, the recent GSOC program we went through with some of the key uh, features that the students, uh, some of the students worked on. Uh, the other program is the University of Waterloo uh, co-op program, and they have a really, uh, I think it's a really cool program where they do, it's a four-year program, uh, but it's spread over five years because you have to do um, six work terms, and so it really allows the students to not only get, you know, the um, the, you know, the standard type of university education, but also go intern for different companies. And so we've had 17 students um, over the time that we've been involved in that program. And we've had, um, I don't have the stats here, but we've had a few that we've uh, continued um, um, employing uh, through internships, as well as one who stayed with us as a contractor now that he's graduated. So another area that I want to highlight to you, um, so this is just a screenshot of our new What is FreeBSD page. And so we do, you know, how do we decide what to do? There's so much to, that we could do to help the project. And so we, uh, what we do is we take input from like events like this, um, from a lot of the work that Greg has actually stepped in to do. So that's from meeting with those, the 20, uh, commercial users that he mentioned yesterday, finding out, you know, why do you use FreeBSD? What are your um, pain points? Um, why are you thinking of using FreeBSD? Why maybe you're hesitant? Um, and so he's, he's providing all that feedback back to us. Um, back in Coimbra for EuroBSDCon in September, uh, Greg also ran a SWOT analysis with the attendees at the uh, Developer Summit. And that was the first time we've ever done that. And that helps identify, like, what do we think, we as a community, think are our weaknesses, our strengths, our opportunities. And so, and then you, you plot it out. And so we actually got really good feedback on that. So we're using that, too, to inform uh, what we're going to do going forward. So, uh, so we get information or input from like, things like that, as well as the other, one other thing that Greg had talked about yesterday was um, the enterprise working group uh, that he's been heading up. And so that's been providing a lot of input too on what we should do to make sure that FreeBSD just works in the enterprise um, you know, market or use case as well as just a, the general purpose use case. Because uh, filling those gaps will really help uh, make FreeBSD a great uh, pro in, um, operating system for uh, not only those applications, but other ones too as the foundation for those. So the reason why I have this screen up here was, um, was actually input from a company who uses FreeBSD, and they said, uh, you know, we, we always need to uh, explain to our vendors and customers why we're using FreeBSD. We think it's great. And, uh, but we would really like you to expand on that information on your website so we could send our, you know, customers and vendors to your website and sell them on it. And so we actually put together this page that really goes into more detail. And when I'm at the end, I'll actually show you um, the web page that you can go to that actually has some of uh, Greg's uh, slides that he had from yesterday. And we put it in one area so that you can send your customers, your students, your, you know, anyone that you want to um, convince the use FreeBSD, because at the end, your, the takeaway, we hope, is why wouldn't everyone use FreeBSD? So like I was talking about uh, earlier, I talked about how we get all this input. We, get, we have um, so many different areas that we want to support, but we do have to narrow it down and look at what's going to be the most impactful to the project. And so th these are some of the areas that we're focused on, and Ed will actually go into more uh, detail when he comes up here on things that he's looking at in his area, sort of the themes that we're following. And really, if you think of it like as themes, then it's, um, 
I mean, because I, I, I'm not going to go through this whole list, but it's really, you know, increasing the adoption of FreeBSD, getting more uh, individuals and, and companies out there to, to use it. But we're focusing on, you know, on key markets uh, right now. Also, um, getting more individuals using FreeBSD. And so uh, we're working on a, a college program that will introduce uh, students who are interested in computing and hopefully operating systems um, will get them involved, sort of like our internship program, um, where we're going to develop training material, uh, how to con you know how to contribute a patch, how to become a developer, and it's going to really help um, develop a program to bring not only on uh, college students but everyone else the the ideas to help make like the installation and getting started with FreeBSD much smoother. So people want to stay with FreeBSD. Um, as far as advocacy, a couple of people brought this up yesterday. I think Justin and, and Alan did, um, that we need to increase our, you know, our advocacy and our visibility of FreeBSD, and we recognize that. And so that's an area where um, we are going to provide more technical content. We're going to talk about like why FreeBSD What's so great about some of these technologies that are in FreeBSD, like DTrace and Jails and, and ZFS, things like that. And, um, and both at, for technical and, and non-technical people, too. And, and broaden, um, you know, to broaden the awareness of FreeBSD out there, work with people who can help us make FreeBSD more visible to a broader audience. So that's, that's one thing we're working on. And then the last thing here is really um, you know, strengthening the relationships that we have with commercial users, with individuals, and really be there to help, help folks. So just to get you an idea of how, how do we fund all this work, um, this is our history, our financial history, just in a nutshell, income versus expenses. And you'll see that um, yeah, we've been sort of steady, steadily growing over the years, but uh, for us to fund the efforts that I'm talking about and that Ed will cover, um, it takes a lot of money. And, um, and that's why I'm showing this to you. And, um, and I know that there's a lot of companies here who have given us money um, and, and consistently too over the years. And, um, and if, you know, if, if you can help in any way getting the word out to help us get more funding, that would be great. Um, the other way that you could really help, I know uh, yesterday Greg had his request on, um, you know, asking your vendors and customers, you know, what are, what's your FreeBSD story? But what I'd like to ask is, um, is share your story and uh, do it in ways like uh, provide a testimonial, a case study, write uh, an article. We have actually the FreeBSD journal here. Uh, it's professionally published. And, um, and so you can write about your use cases um, for this here. But, but help, help shine a light on FreeBSD, and that will really make a significant difference. So that is my talk. And, um, there are a couple things that I did want to make sure that I included here um, from, from our marketing was just that. So the, new, the journal, the new issue is coming out, I think, today or tomorrow. Um, we're also converting it to HTML. This will take time. But we're trying to make it, I mean, these articles are amazing. And, um, it's, and each issue that comes out is full of so much uh, information that people, what we really want is people to be able to search on Google and find these articles. And right now, it's, it's very difficult to do that. So we are uh, making the effort to convert everything um, to HTML. And um, also, a community survey will be coming out. And this is another way to inform um, what we're doing, what we should do. What do people in the community, and this is outside of developers too, uh, you know, what do you want? And what's important to you? And, um, and that's, that survey is in, in conjunction with, uh, with the core team. <clears throat> so we've worked together on like, you know, what are our goals of the survey, 
as well as what are the questions that we want to ask. So that will be going out. Um, I think it's in a week. I'm trying to remember now. Um, and so that's all I have. I just I want to see if anyone has questions. We're open to answering questions. If there's anything unclear about what we do, or how do how do we decide what to fund? Okay, everyone feels like they have a good sense of what we do. Okay, so now for the test to make sure. No, I'm kidding. Uh, okay, so now what we're going to do, actually. Um, so before I open Ed's presentation, I wanted to share that new uh, web page uh, with you, and I'll okay. We'll close Slack. I know you can all see this. Um, so uh, so this is at on our website previouscfoundation.org, and uh, URL is well. You'll find this from the menu uh, if you go to. Uh, FreeBSD project, and then what is FreeBSD, and that will take you there. And so, um, so some of the, the information we have is what I shared. Some of the information um, that we have here is uh, what Greg shared yesterday. Uh, and what we try to do is just break out what are the, you know, the, the basically the key selling points of why you would want to use FreeBSD. And then down here you'll see. Um, so we are pulling out, having more technical information about some of these uh, key, feature, uh, key features that I talked about earlier. Uh, we're still growing this and still writing content, so not everything's here. So these links actually take you to the handbook right now. Uh, talk to you about companies that are using FreeBSD. Uh, really show this, um, you know, where FreeBSD stands out and how all these new firsts that we have, and one thing also I'd like to point out too when I, when I see this, the fact of bringing new people in to the foundation, and I think this is the same with, with the project, is that when you have new eyes, they see things that maybe you, just, you don't see anymore. And um, you know, it's like living in a beautiful place and not recognizing how beautiful it is because you see it every day. And so, um, so have, bringing someone new in who actually recognized these firsts and put together this information for us um, is really helpful. I mean, it's helpful to us, helpful to the project, um, and it's helpful to companies to really see how FreeBSD, we've been around for 30 years, and, um, and it's still innovative, secure, stable, all the things that people talk about. And, um, and we're looking to make sure going forward that uh, it not only stays that, but it's, you know, it's a leader in different areas and it's innovative. And like what Andy was saying, that that's going to be, you know, that that's going to be one of their solutions. I forgot how he, he phrased it, but, you know, FreeBSD will be ahead or they'll be integrating everything into FreeBSD too. So anyway, I did want to just share that with you so you see that we have that available on our website. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand it off to Ed. And um, let's see here if I can find. I'm doing this without, OK, I'll put my reading glasses on. Oh, start from the beginning. And, then, and so one more thing right before he starts, and I'll, I'll switch off. But, um, but I brought, I think we had about we, we brought a lot with us because we want people not only take these for you know yourselves, um, but also to share these with uh, your colleagues at work. So please feel free to. We do still have, maybe have twenty left, and so so it's not only that we're trying to get rid of our swag like John was saying earlier, but really we want people to have this. It's I don't know if you've looked at it, but it does have a timeline poster in the center, which is really it's. Uh, I'm not going to open it here because there's a staple, but. Um, but we put a lot of work into that, and it's actually really cool. So, so please make sure you take some for your colleagues. And I will hand this off to Ed. Thanks, Deb.
So I'm Ed Mast, and I have been working for the foundation for about a decade um, now, and uh, started sort of part-time, and for the last several years, um, have been employed full-time managing the technology group. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit about projects that the foundation has funded, um, and some things about where we're looking to go. Um, so here's a uh, graph of commits that have gone into FreeBSD that identified the foundation as a sponsor. Um, looking here from 2022 on, um, if you extended further back uh, earlier, you'd see um, a lot of growth kind of leading up to the consistent level um, of sponsored commits that, that are, are here, um, at least in the source tree, which is blue. Uh, and that corresponds very, very much with the funding um, that, uh, if, that we looked at from Deb's, Deb's graph, basically, um, for the last many years, um, we've been able to really increase the amount of direct funded projects that the foundation takes on internally. Um, and over time, it's been, our focus has been historically uh, focused on the source tree. Um, so the blue uh, commit counts there, you can see that that's really where um, our full-time staff, contractors, project grants um, historically have been focused. But if you look, uh, the red bars um, over the last uh, couple of months um, have been uh, extensive. We've, we've done some extensive work in the ports tree. And I'll talk about that uh, in a moment when I talk about the contractors and staff that we, we do have. Um, and then uh, the little yellow bar there for doc commits. Um, there's, a, there's some sponsored doc work from the foundation, but that's something else that I'll touch on in a little bit. Um, and the graph on the right, I think, is a really interesting um, uh, and important point that just shows the breakdown of, um, this is looking at all sponsored commits um, in FreeBSD um, over the last year, and basically what portion of commits that identify a sponsor have the foundation as the sponsor. Um, and it's, it's a little bit over a third, basically, of sponsored commits um, that are going into the source tree are coming from the foundation. And of course, you know, this is, um, it's a little bit hard to measure exactly what that means in terms of the quantity of work. Um, commit counts, you know, some commits are small, some commits are big. Uh, but I think the, the point is that the foundation has, um, is in a, p a position where we are consistently contributing technical work um, across a, a wide variety of components in the, the source tree. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about the staff that we have. Deb touched on this, but uh, I'll go over some of the things that um, folks work on. The staff that are on here are essentially our full-time um, foundation employees or, uh, or full-time contractors. Um, and so I manage the technology group overall, um, look at sort of facilitating our roadmap planning and where we are, uh, we're looking to, to go, um, as well as some direct hands-on uh, technical work. So I work um, with the security team. Um, and I do, do hands-on work in the tool chain um, and a few other uh, build infrastructure areas, things like that. Um, and then Joe on here is um, our project coordinator, so he handles a lot of the day-to-day -day, um, aspects of the projects that we're working on, and in particular, the project grants. Um, so we fund uh, full-time and contract employees kind of on a long-term basis, and then we also fund individual project grants where typically someone proposes an idea to the foundation that they want to be able to work on for some period of time, um, and Joe manages all of the, those aspects. Caustic is a long-term, or a long-time, rather, contributor to the foundation, um, and is, is one of FreeBSD's x86 low-level experts, and also uh, the VM system, and uh, LibC, and uh, RTLD, and Lib, Lib THR, and all kinds of uh, uh, areas. Caustic works on quite a lot, of, um, a lot of things, and I think having that capacity within the foundation is, um, is very sort of important to be able to provide consistent, sustained uh, uh, effort on things that maybe don't generate a lot of um, uh, a lot of noise, but um, consistent bug fixes, consistent kind of just improvements, um, making sure that things keep working well. Uh, Lee Wen 
is primarily focused on CI, but covers quite a lot of um, uh, quite a lot of things. Lee Wen also works um, with the cluster admin team and was instrumental in doing all of the heavy lifting in FreeBSD's transition to Git. Um, so setting up the um, setting up all of the infrastructure and, and um, all of the the kind of uh, behind the scenes work to make that happen, um, along with uh, community members who, who did, uh, who worked on the, the conversion process and things like that. But Lee Wen was instrumental in getting the, the server infrastructure and everything set up for that. And Lee Wen also uh, works on our images for Azure. So Lee Wen built a lot of the, uh, and worked closely with Microsoft to get a lot of the infrastructure in place so that those images are, um, are automatable and built, um, uh, built cleanly and uh, so that they can be handed off um, and just be built as part of the regular release engineering process. And then Pierre, um, we brought Pierre on primarily with a, a desire to focus more on kind of end user, user land applications. We, we've historically had kind of a focus on uh, the source tree and especially the the kernel, the source sys uh, subdirectory um, within the foundation. So Caustic, for example, is, is very much um, you know, a, a deep low level kernel um, engineer. And so Pierre's, uh, our goal with Pierre was basically to be able to have the foundation look at more end user facing um, things. Uh, it turns out though that F Pierre's first task was updating OpenSSL to OpenSSL 3 because that was a key thing that was holding up FreeBSD 14. Um, so we had Pierre uh, take that on initially. And that also goes to um, um, where, well, I'll get to that in one second. Uh, it also goes to the, um, uh, the increase in ports commits that we've had over the last couple of months. Um, so that's Moyne, who's on a slide a few slides ahead, um, who did a lot of the work to address fallout from the OpenSSL update in the ports tree, uh, as well as uh, fallout from LLVM imports. Um, contractors on here, um, these are people that we have on a long-term, um, but not necessarily full-time uh, basis. Um, so uh, John, for example, as you uh, all know quite well, um, uh, John has a, a contract with us um, to be able to step in for areas where there's a very specific uh, technical domain uh, expertise. So things like beehive security vulnerabilities, if there's something you know, that we need to be able to address in a timely fashion, having that contract in place means that we can buy a little bit of John's time to, to fix something that's, that's really timely without having um, someone on a full-time uh, basis. And then Mitchell Horn. Um, Mitchell was my co-op student several years ago, um, has now graduated um, and has an occasional um, uh, occasional contract with us. Mitchell works on free, Risk Five in FreeBSD, um, but also uh, Mitchell is doing quite a lot of improvements to the documentation, uh, making sure that our developer documentation, especially, is is up to date. Um, Bjorn works on uh, the Wi-Fi stack in FreeBSD, and I'll get to um, another comment on uh, uh, Wi-Fi in just a second. And then Mark um, Mark was working uh, on a more consistent basis with the foundation. Um, but we still have him on an occasional contract so that he can contribute uh, across multiple areas of FreeBSD. And anyone who's involved in, in FreeBSD knows uh, Mark fairly well. He works on quite a lot of things and uh, I think is doing a very good job at kind of trying to drive uh, a lot of things forward. Um, here we have some contractors who are more specific project focused. Um, and I won't go into to everyone, but um, uh, I'll mention uh, Moyne, as I said, was uh, instrumental in fixing a lot of uh, issues in the ports tree. Um, we've brought uh, Cheng on um, to work with Bjorn on improving the Wi-Fi stack, um, making sure that we can try and make progress uh, more quickly than we have uh, in the past. Um, and then we have individual project grants like Robert here, um, who's working on some uh, SIMD uh, libc routines, optimized versions of things like mem, uh, mem copy and, and things of that nature. Um, Olivier also I'll mention, um, we've brought Olivier on to, uh, to work on a variety of, of different things, um, but he's um, eventually going to look at things like tuning, uh, automatic uh, 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 system tuning. Um, a lot of the, the tunables in FreeBSD are 
um, are sort of set from default or set based on the environment from quite a long time ago um, and uh, being able to to automatically uh, scale those things as your memory or CPU count or, or such goes up is uh, something that's going to be quite interesting. Um, and uh, Olivier has had quite a few commits into FreeBSD in a few different areas uh, um, already of late. Um, and then echoing what Deb said, I'm not going to touch on everyone here, but um, this is uh, some of our, uh, um, these, these are some of our interns who worked for the foundation um, this last uh, summer. Uh, I'll mention Jake's um, specifically because Capsicum is something that is uh, very um, important to, to the foundation that we've funded for quite a long time and, and Jake worked on um, uh, some tooling to improve the, the process of applying Capsicum to applications but also uh, bringing in a Capsicumized uh, or Capsized uh, syslog D. Um, so I'm going to talk about a few projects that we've um, that we've funded that are either uh, complete or or nearly complete. Um, this is one online uh, RAID Z expansion that has uh, been a long, long time coming. Um, the foundation funded this project several years ago, um, and we got about 80% of the way there with um, uh, Matt Aaron's. Um, but we weren't able to get it kind of completed through for a few uh, a few different uh, reasons, but. It is extremely close now to being in up to landing in upstream ZFS. The um, uh, it's been uh, been reviewed by uh, Open ZFS experts, um, and the comment here I, I pasted this in last night, so it's four days ago now that the comment here was added. But uh, we're we're basically I think days away at this point of it landing in um, Open ZFS upstream. After which it will make it into an Open ZFS release and into FreeBSD uh, with the next import. Um, Wi-Fi has uh, been a long-standing uh, effort for us, um, limited somewhat by the, the time that Bjorn has had available, and so that's one of the reasons that we wanted to bring someone else on to, to work with Bjorn and try and move a bit faster here. Um, but uh, this includes uh, Intel and Realtek drivers um, using Linux KPI, um, and our primary goal from here is uh, bringing speeds to where they're um, uh, reasonable for uh, the, the, current, uh, the current era. Uh, these slides all have a, a link to um, the uh, foundation's project site that talks a little bit more about the, the specific projects. Um, WireGuard, this is uh, an example of a project that uh, we funded John to do. Um, and basically, the foundation stepped in because we wanted to make sure that the WireGuard, um, uh, the, the WireGuard module in, made it back into FreeBSD, and, and everyone was um, was happy and comfortable with uh, with it. So, John's first task was to um, to make sure that Open Crypto in the kernel provided all of the uh, uh, crypto primitives that WireGuard required, so that we weren't. Uh, using sort of a bespoke implementation that came with the WireGuard uh, module. It was uh, it's standard infrastructure that's in FreeBSD. Um, and then just uh, code review and kind of shepherding the, the uh, integration efforts to get it back into the tree. And so it's in 13.2 and in, in 14. Um, Beehive, uh, this is an interesting um, item because uh, Andy's talk mentioned Beehive ARM64 work uh, as well, and it's the same uh, same developer, Andy Turner, um, worked for the foundation and, for a while um, and worked on uh, ARM64 Beehive uh, for us, but also Mark Johnston is working on some of the aspects of, of, six, of getting the 64-bit uh, ARM support into the tree. Um, and this is, so this is a, definitely a collaboration between multiple parties. This work started um, at uh, University in Bucharest um, and has been uh, continuously kind of updated and ported forward and uh, is finally at the point where it's, um, it's there, there's a very clear line, line of sight into getting it into the tree now. Um, and then, as I mentioned, John working on security issues to get reported in Beehive and getting timely fixes for them. Um, LLVM, we've funded uh, quite a bit of work to improve the debugger uh, in, LL, in LLVM LLDB. And it's essentially at, 
at parity with um, with GDB. Uh, John may may have uh, some comment on that, but but LLDB is now a usable debugger for FreeBSD, um, both for user land and kernel. Um, we funded work to do the base uh, kernel infrastructure um, for that, and a uh, GSOC student over the summer, uh, one of Li Wen's um, GSOC students, uh, implemented module support for LLDB, which was the final. Um, kernel module support. So that was the final piece um, remaining to be able to use LLDB as a kernel debugger for FreeBSD. Uh, security, uh, as, as I mentioned, we definitely have a strong interest in security from the foundation, um, funding some of my time uh, on the security team, and then development efforts, um, like bringing, uh, uh, sys bringing Capscom into syslogd, uh, Jake's uh, summer internship, as I mentioned. Um, Caustic has worked a lot on vulnerability mitigations, and um, we're definitely interested in participating in the Cherry ecosystem. Um, you know, as it sort of uh, as it transitions from being research to um, widely deployed, we, we definitely take an interest in participating in that. Um, we continue to support efforts on Tier One CPUs, um, uh, and and also non-tier one CPUs, but uh, tier one being x86 and ARM 64-bit uh, 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 at this point. Um, for FreeBSD 14, uh, we did a bunch of work to increase the maximum supported CPU count to 1,024 as servers uh, from uh, uh, x86 and ARM servers uh, become available in the market um, uh, with more than 256 CPUs, which was our uh, our limit in earlier versions of FreeBSD, um, it, we, we funded the effort uh, to address bottlenecks and increase um, uh, increase hard-coded limitations um, that prevent us from going past uh, 256 CPUs. Um, there's a bit of work that follows on from that um, to be able to assign interrupts to all of those CPUs. Um, that work is, uh, that work works for Intel um, today, but not AMD, and so we, we need to address that. Um, and then also RISC-V general support from uh, Mitchell's, uh, Mitchell's efforts. So this is, um, that's sort of the end of where I wanted to talk about what, uh, a few highlights of some of the projects we've worked on, but I wanna talk a little bit about sort of where, where we wanna go and where we wanna invest our efforts. Um, and one of the things I think that we, in the foundation we really wanna support, and this is sort of, um, uh, in discussion with um, the core team and, and others just as we try and figure out where we're going to invest, um, I think we really want FreeBSD to be the best environment for someone who's new to systems programming, like a, a, a student who wants to learn about systems programming. Um, we want FreeBSD to be the best environment uh, for that to happen. And so here I've, I've listed some of the things that, that need to come out of that, right? Um, uh, and so, you know, the, 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 you, you only get one, one, uh, one chance to make a first impression. And as soon as we have a hiccup in the FreeBSD process, uh, the installation and the very first user experience, it's very easy for someone to get tripped up over something and decide that FreeBSD just isn't for them or it's too much work or um, and to just give up. And so I think it's very important that, um, you know, basically, from the time that you decide you want to give FreeBSD a try to the time that you're sort of committed and you're willing to overlook the flaws and or fix them, um, that, pro that, that needs to be uh, very, very smooth. And so that's the installer and um, hardware support. Um, you know, we want to make sure that there's a set of laptops um, that people can, that you can choose from and, and know that FreeBSD is gonna work, your wireless is gonna work, sound is gonna work. When you plug your headphones into the headphone jack, it automatically switches to, um, to those headphones. Um, and so the, um, the images that are on here are um, actually some of the, the candidates that we're looking at for this. So there's a couple of ThinkPads here, lots of FreeBSD developers who use, um, use a daily driver FreeBSD laptop are using ThinkPads. Um, there's a couple of Dell uh, machines that are, are of interest for, um, 
for various reasons. The framework laptop is, is interesting just because of the way that that ecosystem uh, is developing and the approach taken by, um, by the company. And we've had some, some good in discussions and interaction with them um, when we've run into FreeBSD issues on the, that hardware. Um, and then there's also a Mac down here in the bottom. And lots of, um, lots of FreeBSD developers uh, use Macs as their, their daily drivers. And that's, you know, for better or worse, it is what it is. Uh, I'd love to have FreeBSD be usable as your desktop environment uh, for everyone. But um, we also, I also want FreeBSD to, to work very well if you are using it in a VM, if you're using a Mac as your primary uh, environment, I really want to make sure that it's a, a smooth and uh, productive experience. And so we really want to be able to have good tooling um, so that if you're a new developer, um, things are well documented and you're able to, to do things like profiling your code, debugging your code, and understanding what you're working on. Um, and then just some other, uh, other things that we're, we're interested in, in focusing on. So, um, we really need to make sure that uh, uh, we have consistently produced artifacts that um, you can take the latest FreeBSD and install and, and try it out. This, this, uh, I was very interest, or very encouraged by Gleb's uh, talk this or add-on talk this morning. I think that is something that's um, you know very very much dovetails with uh, areas the foundation would like to focus. Um, and so that's, uh, that's basically um, the extent of what I have to present, uh, present here. Um, definitely, the foundation is, you know, events like this are, are very good for getting uh, feedback as we try and look at where we're going to invest and, and where we are going to um, uh, focus our development efforts. And so the discussion that, that uh, Gleb prompted this morning was, is very, very valuable to, to drive some of those um, uh, discussions. And we've also, in collaboration with the core team, have been looking to try and understand kind of what is the project's roadmap? Um, what are the, the things that the project feels um, are the core team uh, and the project sort of um, via the core team um, uh, feels are important for us to invest in over the next, next year or two years? Um, so with that, I'll uh, take any uh, questions, and then over lunch, uh, I'm happy to have further discussions. I've got a plant in the audience. Yeah, pr I promise <laughs> it wasn't a plant. I, I, maybe Ed's going to beat me up after this one. Um, but, uh, you know, something that I'm interested in, I think that the audience would be interested in, and something that you and I have kind of talked about on and off, and that was embedded a little bit in some of your points, but clearly FreeBSD is a community-driven software project, right, and has been for a, a long time, you know, as long as any thriving open source project has been, probably. Um, and, but, you know, you look at that chart that you shared where the FreeBSD Foundation is now, you know, contributing a significant percentage of uh, the sponsored commits into source, and in increasingly into ports as well. <clears throat> so I know that there's a method to the madness that, you know, sort of in terms of considerations, what's the right thing for the foundation to be doing? You know, how do we fill the gaps? What are the considerations that go into deciding this is an area where it makes sense for the foundation to, to, to be involved. Um, so I'd just be interested in <clears throat> hearing your thoughts uh, on that topic. Yeah, I think that it's a really good question. Um, you know, how do we decide what we are going to fund? And, and more importantly, how do we decide where we're not uh, investing? Um, and I think there's, there's quite a few different things that feed into that. Um, and so one, one principle is that our, our primary goal is not to kind of supplant work that is happening within the community already. Um, and so, you know, if, when, when companies um, have an area of, of specific interest to them and, and are developing um, features and, and improvements for FreeBSD um, and working with Upstream uh, to get those features in. So, you know, I, as an example, I can, I can talk about the network stack uh, improvements that come from Netflix. 
Um, you know, that's something that the, the foundation really doesn't need to invest in um, because that is the, the, the FreeBSD community, whether it's um, a single entity or multiple uh, contributors within the FreeBSD community are driving that forward and, and keeping FreeBSD in a very um, uh, competitive place. And so um, that's something that the foundation, you know, doesn't really need to, to, to focus on. Um, what we do focus on is gaps that are not getting addressed by the broader community or areas that, um, uh, areas that really um, have sort of benefit across um, FreeBSD users, um, but are not, uh, don't rise to the level that a single entity would um, be willing to fund by themselves. And so a lot of things like developer tools really fit into that category, right? Um, it's, it's expensive uh, and it's a lot of work to have a really good development in, development environment, um, and it benefits everyone in the FreeBSD community if we have good tooling, if we have good performance uh, tooling, good debuggers, uh, good tool chain, good compilers. That really benefits everyone, but no one wants to dedicate a, a huge amount of, of money to that because it's, it is expensive, and, and um, it, it really is something, I think, where the foundation has a really good role to play and kind of do things that broadly benefit um, uh, everyone. Um, definitely as far as kind of roadmap decisions go, events like this are, are really good for getting feedback. Um, you know, uh, meetings with, um, with companies, um, the enterprise working group that uh, Greg heads up is very useful for getting feedback um, about areas that um, are broadly of interest to multiple, um, multiple FreeBSD users. Um, and I think one of the interesting things is you know, we have good representation um, often from the sort of vendor community, pe people in the FreeBSD community who build products on FreeBSD um, or even if not building a product, sort of use FreeBSD as an input to something they're producing. Um, and I think uh, efforts like um, the Enterprise Working Group are really good for us to get feedback from people who are using FreeBSD as uh, a commodity server, right? They're, they're using FreeBSD in the ways that um, OSs have been used for a long, long time. Um, and I think um, that's, that's an area where um, we haven't had a, as good of a source of feedback um, compared to the, the vendor community um, of, of late. And so being able to get that feedback is, is really, really valuable. Um, and then with the core team, uh, you know, we get feedback from the, the FreeBSD community um, sort of as a whole to, to inform our, uh, our areas of focus. Well, so it's actually time for us to break for lunch. So why don't we go ahead and uh, take our break now, and we'll come back at 1.30. Uh, if you have more questions for Deb or Ed, I'm sure you can hit them up during lunch and ask those. So we'll break for lunch now.
Chester. Hey folks, we're gonna get started again soon if you wanna go ahead and make our way to our seats. So our <coughs> first talk of the afternoon is going to be from Ian and Mike from Medify. So I'll hand it over to you guys. Thank you very much. Are we live? All right, that's working. We are live. All right, thanks guys. Um, pleasure to meet everybody. It's first time here at, uh, at uh, the summit. Look forward to hopefully having many more um, occasions to come back and talk to you guys. So. With that, uh, my name is Mike Wagner. I'm the CEO of, uh, and co-founder of Medify. And Ian Evans, CTO of Medify. So I guess let's uh, jump on in, Ian, if you're good with uh, cruising over to the next slide. Yeah. Okay, so to kind of help wake things up Friday afternoon, let's uh, provide a, a little extra caffeinated energy for you. I'm gonna give out a $20 Starbucks card, an e-gift, so I, I will need your email address, but um, for a very easy meme to complete, I'm hoping you guys have all heard this. If not, that's okay. Um, but the meme is, there is, and, and raise your hand if you know the answer. Okay, first person, raise their hand. So, there is no cloud. Boom, we've got, booyah. There it is, $20 to the man on the right. All right, thank you, I'll just, I'll need your card and then I'll e-gift that over to you as soon as we finish up here. Um, you know, no truer statement could, could have been made, right? When you think about um, what's been happening in the public cloud space for the last nine years, 10 years, it's unbelievable. And the growth has been truly amazing. And prior to, uh, founding Med Hat, Red, uh, prior, prior to founding Medify, I was actually with Red Hat. And that's how Ian and I met. I'll talk about that in another slide here. But um, it's really fascinating when you see all the money and all the dev and all the effort that's gone into public cloud. And then when you look at private cloud hasn't gone anywhere. In fact, it's, it's grown. Um, so it's really interesting when you consider, okay, all this attention, all this uh, incredible activity and investment happening at the top of the stack, and yet what really matters the most is where we all are playing, um, and that infrastructure piece keeps growing and growing and growing, and yet it doesn't seem like as much attention is paid to it as there really should be, or investment for that matter, right? So. Um, we're trying to uh, buck that trend a bit, and so far, so good. Um, and I you know, really want to give a heartfelt thanks to the folks at the FreeBSD Foundation, because they've just been, um, and the community overall, have been amazing to work with, a lot of fun, and uh, just willing to um, you know, be open and go after things. And uh, we look forward to introducing more of our community um, from a customer perspective into the FreeBSD family. So uh, it's just a great group of folks, and for that, Thanks very much, guys, for, for planning this and putting it on. Um, so what else do I want to talk about here? Yeah, so we had a really nice growth in 2022 um, from a private cloud perspective. Um, and that's where originally Ian and I had kind of positioned our efforts was on edge-based um, installations and uh, with another startup that was out of the San Jose area uh, a few years back. Um, and now, you know, across the board, where we're seeing these edge use cases pop up, and I mean, and this is, this is kind of part of that private infrastructure growth, um, all of the changes that are coming around with 5G, 5G NR, 
Um, all these changes that are coming about up, you know, with an ever-connected community, right? Everybody's connected all the time. I've got my iPhone up here. Ian's got his iPhone up here. Everybody is always connected. The information is always flowing. How do you service that base? How do you monetize that base? So that's the area we want to play at the low-level connectivity, at the low-level infrastructure side of that um, on the private side, so on the enterprise side in particular. So truly a B2B play. Yeah. So what do we do? Um, so initially, again, it was uh, really an edge solution, um, bare metal provisioning as a service, if you will, if you'd like to add the as a service, which everybody seems to be doing. Yep. Um, so bare metal provisioning as a service was the initial idea for Mojo Platform. Um, and we actually won a really cool award uh, when we initially came out. And, and we got a great anchor first customer, which I'll talk about um, in a minute. But from uh, so Data Center World in Orlando a couple years ago gave us the best new technology, most likely to receive additional funding. So that was really cool. Um, and for me, it was just a matter of a CEO. I'm just trying to think, OK, how do I keep Ian? happy and wanting to develop in this space. And that answer was really easy. Make sure we can do as much as possible on FreeBSD. Um, because you know when you are uh, trying to build a product that requires stability and deep security, um, those are things that are top of mind and certainly keeps Ian up at night. And because it keeps him up, it keeps me up. Um, and so you know, for him, he had a, a history with FreeBSD that I was unaware of before we started this. In fact, when I first met Ian, it was through Red Hat. Um, which was kind of funny, but uh, we were developing the solution on, on Red Hat bits for, you know, there's components of it that were in there, and you know, we got a chance to beta the product, if you will, almost alpha it um, at our old roles. And that was where we saw, and we knew the demand was there, but it was great to get that validation from, you know, Fortune 100 customers saying, okay, we are struggling here. We need help from an infrastructure perspective. Can you make this easier for us? Um, so that was our, our first product. And then the second product uh, came along as a result of COVID, actually. Um, there are a number of teachers in Ian's neighborhood, we'll call it, broader mm -hmm. general area, mm -hmm. um, in uh, Loudoun County, I guess, Virginia. Ian lives in the, the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains. Those are granite mountains. Yeah, very, <laughs> got a Blue Ridge fan over here. Uh, very difficult to get a cell signal through there, and there's no fiber running in there. So um, there was a need to help teachers uh, provide rural broadband so they could have uh, remote classes for their kids. So we set up um, a, a WISP that uh, eventually grew into a full BIOS uh, ISP. So we have um, fiber as well. So um, yeah, so those are the two products. And they both do very different things, but they're both um, anchored in having the ability to provision and automate them from a day two operations perspective with Mojo Platform. OK, um, freedom to choose. Yeah, this was, um, this was a big thing that we recognized firsthand when, uh, I was, when we were in our prior role. So Ian was um, oh boy, uh, the uh, what, global architect, global principal architect for the yeah, open, open, architect. open Telco Group, right? OK, at uh, WWT. Uh, they're a, a big uh, like $13 billion a year uh, SI out of St. Louis, if you're not familiar. Um, Cisco's largest reseller, big, big shop. Um, we had recruited them, Red Hat had recruited WWT in to be one of our, called it's our new Apex program. We wanted them to be one of our Apex partners, um, which were SIs that knew how to uh, deliver OpenShift solutions, so Kubernetes solutions, um, and they were able to implement them, integrate them, and really provide everything that a customer would need if they wanted to set up DevOps. You know, all again, all this upstack, really deep investment stuff that everybody's got extremely excited about and you know, billions and billions of dollars were poured into this space. Um, so that's how we met initially, because we saw this potential to do very cool low-level stuff because of this new standard called Redfish. Um, so I'm not sure if you guys are very familiar with Redfish, the Redfish API, awesome, very good, a few guys, awesome. Alan, of course, yes, great. Um, so we were seeing this promise of open standards at a low level beginning to take hold. Um, and so it was OpenBMC, um, the Open Compute Project, it was uh, SNEA with Swordfish, it was Redfish, and we started seeing all of the major manufacturers lining up and saying, okay, we'll do this. Um, and 
as I'm sure you guys have seen, it's never easy to get all these different manufacturers to agree on a single standard. And then they like tweaking them, and then they like messing with them, and, and you know, introducing other standards in an attempt to you know, sort of have their own way with things. So to see everything kind of congeal and come together here over the last five years has been amazing. Um, and uh, you know, no small shout out to the DMTF and the great work that they've done to make that happen for Redfish, um, as well as the Open Compute Project guys, and um, you know, all, all the hard work that's being done from an open standards perspective to make this all possible. So what this enabled and what Ian kind of had the foresight of seeing is like, if this all does work out, there's gonna be this potential to do cross-platform, low-level provisioning, integration, day two operational work from a single pane of glass. Wouldn't that be cool? Right, because that's one of the big factors, one of the main reasons that public cloud has grown as quickly as it has is because managing bare metal is a pain. And I guess, I think we can probably move to the next slide here. Um, yeah, so maybe we'll go back and forth here a little bit. Mm -hmm. We're just kind of uh, rifting here. I sort of threw the deck into disarray, just kind of wanted to uh, talk a bit about public cloud and, and where we come in. But managing metal isn't easy. Um, so three big things. Uh, the software that is all proprietary based on the hardware. So to do the low-level out-of-band stuff, you have to sign up and purchase the agreements with the hardware manufacturers themselves, with the OEMs themselves, and it's, it's good stuff. It's, it's bloated, and it uh, uh, takes a while to learn, um, but it, it does do the job, um, but it's also proprietary, so it only works on that particular OEM's hardware. Um, now, with the promise of the hardware standards came this potential. Uh, to manage it from a single pane, and that's kind of where we placed our bets, and skating to where the puck was going to be, hopefully, and as it turns out, it, it is there. Um, so that was a, a big piece of it. The hardware piece, from a proprietary perspective, the software that sits on top of that is also proprietary, and the final piece is the bus factor. Um, the FTEs training these guys, it, this is kind of not the cool area. It probably doesn't come as a surprise to everyone in the room, this uh, low-level stuff. Uh, it isn't where the big bucks are playing. It's not uh, Docker, it's not uh, Kubernetes, it's, uh, you know, it's not um, AI. You know, th those are all the cool apps that sit on top of all the hard work that we do to make it accessible, to make it work, essentially, right? Um, so yeah, that's the, the final piece is, is how do we not eliminate, but at least help corral the bus factor of having a single guy who knows how the systems operate, who know how the systems run, who know, you know, kind of holds the keys to the castle, if you will, from an infrastructure perspective. So private infrastructure, you know, it's another big reason that it ended up jumping over to cloud was because that was a, a safety net in many ways, right? You have a bunch of guys that can quickly get trained on AWS and spinning up AMIs. That, that's a true safety feature from a knowledge management perspective. Um, but there's a big cost associated with that. So at some point, and what we've seen across the board, uh, both in my prior role and then now with um, Ian here at Medify, there is a, a pivot moment when customers realize, okay, this is not sustainable for our business. We need to bring our workloads back in. And we've also seen some really interesting and bad behavior um, on the public cloud side of things that, you know, it, it makes you question, maybe it is important to have your bits on your servers. Um, and there's a number of different reasons why that uh, may be the case. So security is also a big consideration. It's something that we've put um, first and foremost. And one of the things that I found just amazing, and, and I knew that FreeBSD had a rather incredible base um, from a customer perspective in terms of um, shops that have, like us, that have built their products on FreeBSD. Um, it was incredible to see uh, the gentleman from Netflix, is he? Is, I can't recall, is it Gleb? Yeah, so it, just a really cool presentation. And you know, I mean, it's, it's hard to grok 10 to 13% of internet traffic running through and on FreeBSD as a result of being uh, pushed through Netflix servers. But that's just, you know, unbelievable when you consider. And one of the things I asked, you know, I'm like, how did you get Netflix to even consider putting it on FreeBSD to begin with, coming off of, I don't know, it was Akamai or whatever, but you know, it's just an interesting, uh, an incredible motion, if you will, to take that from uh, an outside player and then to do it DIY, to roll your own and say, okay, we know we can do this and save God knows how many millions, if not more, per year, I don't know. But uh, similarly, that's, those are the advantages that are becoming extremely visible. This technology commoditization curve catches us all eventually, right? And especially from a hardware perspective, the power now that's built into these smaller boxes with smaller footprints, the things that you can do now with just uh, 
you know, a, a really small footprint in a, uh, you know, at the base of a tower is incredible. And a lot of that is really you know, driving what we're going to see from a 5G on our perspective. Um, and hopefully all these new monetization use cases that are uh, potentially out there. So um, that kind of brings us to, uh, I believe, the Major League Baseball. Yeah, so MLB. Um, this was, we had been open for about a year. Um, we had ported um, all the software, I ported, we, we got rid of all of our original build and started from scratch, um, from the ground up, uh, built our code in Python, using Python mainly. Um, and we had a production ready product we felt, it's, you know, an MVP that we felt was ready to go. Um, and then we were brought in, we, we really run our business almost all through channel partners. Um, so we have technology partners, we have SIs, um, you know, we have uh, big box shops, if you will, guys that push a lot of hardware. And we've got, you know, smaller consulting type houses that we, we work with across the board. Um, in this case, Major League Baseball was brought to us by one of our partners out of Toronto. Um, called Arctic, um, and they're, they were at the time, and I think they're still one of the top Anthos um, SIs, Anthos implementers in the world. Um, so uh, for those of you unfamiliar, Google Anthos is the enterprise container orchestration platform um, that came from Google. And uh, Major League Baseball and Google signed a, a big contract together, so they, um, MLB is a design partner, so together um, we were brought in by um, Arctic, and then we partnered with Google on this to, uh, to make it all happen. They had been struggling for about six months to get uh, this thing put together, and t they really, the big driver for them, and the reason that um, we were brought in, was they wanted to get off of VMware. Imagine that. Um, they were you know, moving over to containers, um, container orchestration in particular uh, by Anthos, and to have this second layer of abstraction with VMware was just completely unnecessary. So as containers have kind of taken over from a workloads perspective, and it's now official, it's like 52% of workloads are, are running in containers over, over VMs now, which is an amazing number. Um, as that occurred, you know, people are recognizing, okay, what's the optimal way to run this, and how can we save money in the process, right? So obviously, the very low-hanging low fruit is, is you know, do it correctly, run it on containers, get rid of the virtualization, save yourself a bunch of money, and, uh, and then also usually gain in horsepower. So, and those are the things that uh, Major League Baseball wanted to solve, and we were able to um, accommodate them and, and do that. It was one of the, you know, very quickly they recognized the potential and the value in Mojo Platform. We demoed it for them, and I think they said, let's just go straight to production in like uh, one week later. Yeah, so they said, quick. yeah, can we just skip the trial, go straight to production, and get this thing ready for the 2021 season? So that's what we did. And um, yeah, it's been a really awesome relationship. A lot of folks, um, I guess, you know what, here's another, let's, let's do this. So another 20 bucks, uh, Starbucks card. Who can guess how many terabytes of data per game are pushed from a Major League Baseball game up into GCP for every game? And I'll, I'll give you a range. It's between one and 15 terabytes. So first person to get within a single terabyte wins. Go ahead. Boom, how the, wait a second. <laughs> Come on. Wow, okay. That is really good. Lucky seven, that is correct. Okay, $20, I'll, I'll need your card. Um, that's awesome. It's actually 7.2 terabytes per game is pushed into the cloud, uh, into GCP. So it's a true hybrid solution. Um, and the heavy lifting is done by um, our clusters. So we provision, uh, Major League Baseball provisions and instantiates their Anthos clusters from a single site. Uh, another one of the big things that was hurting them is you know, the ability to update um, operating system patches, zero day vulnerabilities in general, right? Firmware. So, yeah, firmware, absolutely. Firmware on the, um, uh, with the storage that they had running. I think they had, uh, what were the cards that they had? 30, uh, it was basically LSI 3108. Yeah, LS, okay, so you know, there's firmware associated with the RAID cards that they had in those servers, in those clusters. Um, so there's a number of things from a travel and expense perspective that they wanted to get rid of. They wanted to be able to remotely manage and um, provision and day two operationally manage these clusters without having to fly people out at the ballparks and do the, uh, what, what does he call it, the thumb, the hand jam. Yeah, so, hand jam. Uh, <laughs> uh, Kevin, Kevin Backman is their, uh, um, was the senior principal architect for them in charge of this and he had this funny, we were on a couple podcasts together and he, he called it uh, get, you know, stopping the hand jam so we didn't have to you know, run around all these ballparks and, and do this thumb drive thing with the BIOS upgrades and, uh, or the potential operating system upgrades, whatever it was that they needed to get done at the low level out of band that may require a power cycle, right? 
So being able to do that um, was something that was critical for them, and we enabled that. And as soon as they saw it uh, kind of happen on our, I think we, we actually had a demo system that was the same as they had in the field, so we just kind of showed yeah, we them just, it. We yeah. just, yeah, stage it and move it over. Yeah, okay. So anyway, that was, that was one of the big wins for us. And, and across the board then, um, you know, we've been with them now for three years, and now we've expanded to um, minor league ballparks as well. Um, and then as it turns out, uh, we just uh, were recently funded, and um, the owner of one of the minor league clubs is actually uh, one of the partners in the group that uh, funded us, so we're really excited to broaden the exposure of FreeBSD with that group. In fact, I'm going up there to meet with them next week, um, and we'll be talking about this. So I'll give them a shout out right now. It's called Title Town Tech out of uh, Green Bay, Wisconsin, by the way. Um, so it's a really, uh, it's a great group, and uh, they are, um, it's interesting because they are actually uh, very closely uh, associated with the Green Bay Packers. In fact, the Green Bay Packers are one of their uh, main partners. So, yep. all right. So then other, other than that, guys, yeah, then um, that kind of, that was just a backdrop. I wanted to give you a little feel for, from a business perspective, um, how we got into this space and, and why we wanted to put Mojo Platform on FreeBSD, as well as um, our Photon router. And, uh, and after, after that, yep. Ian, I'll let you kind of. Appreciate it, Mike, thanks. Yeah. So uh, how does Metify use FreeBSD? Well, I guess going a little bit further back, um, back in 2008, I actually worked for a storage company called Wasabi Systems. I don't know if you guys remember these guys, but they, um, they have a NetBSD shop, and they basically made a hybrid NAS appliance, and that was really kind of my first exposure to BSD. And ever since then, it's just been cumulative. And um, all those lessons learned, everything that we did throughout the years, you know, we've kind of focused on trying to put into this product and make it as, as viable for market as we possibly could. And what we've uh, really been focused on with um, our implementation of BSD is moving away from Linux. Initially, it was a KVM hypervisor environment. Um, everything was essentially built around that. And, you know, we, we didn't necessarily run into a ton of problems, but there was issues, you know, with um, rolling upgrades. You know, we had some performance issues with that. Um, some of the licensing things I'll touch on um, were concerns. So we decided to move over to FreeBSD and, uh, and Beehive. And um, through that process, we've actually implemented our entire Mojo platform on top of that. Um, that platform, and it's worked really, really well. Um, so what we've really uh, focused on with it is uh, some performance optimizations in the kernel. So we, um, we started to use uh, BBR, and that's been really good. Um, we've gone through and um, optimized some of the Beehive environment so it best suits the VMs that we effectively have. And as a result, as you can see in this um, diagram off to the right-hand side, um, we have all of our internal Mojo components running inside of the Beehive environment, which consists of uh, all the Linux. There's Debian in there. And then we also have um, um, another VM that we use for updating. But the idea is eventually we want to be able to take these once the container ecosystem piece is kind of figured out and there's a path forward, is move that more over to a native um, type of implementation in BSD, whatever that tur turns out to be. So we're quite excited about that. Um, so why do we use it? Um, I mean, there's, I'd say the first one is stability. Uh, it's just, it just works out of the box. And it's consistent, it's reliable, and we can usually count on it to do what it says it does, and it stays up for very long periods of time. Uh, performance is, is obviously really good out of the box, too. Uh, we like the fact that we can go in and we can set specific sys controls that pertain to our environment. We can heavily tune the kernel to what we want and how performant we want it. Um, and then also things like documentation. You know, we can always go into the documentation, find what we need. It's great for developers. It's great for customers. And it just works for everybody. So we're very happy with the documentation that it provides. Um, ZFS, that's uh, just great. Um, as I put there, ZFS, 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 it's just, uh, we use that for all our file systems now. It just, it just works really, really well. And then things like ports and packages, um, you know, we can always count on those working, uh, unlike some of the other package management systems where you're just constantly dealing with, you know, uh, stuff missing, and it just becomes a, a very difficult process. Um, so we, we utilize ports and packages quite a bit there. Um, highly secure out of the box. Um, there's very few things that we have to do to kind of secure things. Um, we have our own security controls we put on top of that, but out of the box it works really well. Um, licensing, we like the fact that it's highly flexible and we're not bound to 
uh, licensing structure is you know, constantly changing, you're having to deal with that, and then you're having to kind of pull your product back or reevaluate it and figure out what you're gonna do because the licensing structure is effectively changed. And then of course the community. Um, so how does Mojo work? Um, we've gone through a couple different iterations in this, but essentially what it is, it's a small deployable uh, VM uh, or an appliance. You put it in your data center and effectively what it does, it goes out and you specify the subnets that all your assets, uh, your Redfish enabled assets are on. So it'd be your Dell, HP, Cisco. We don't really care, we keep it relatively agnostic. As long as the node supports Redfish, we can effectively use that. And then Mojo can go out and scan that, and then what it does, it adds it into a CMDB. It catalogs all the resources and information in that, and then presents those forward into a dashboard that customers can then look at and they can leverage, and then deploy a specific workload on it. Um, but besides just having a system that deploys a very basic workload, like, hey, I want to install you know, FreeBSD or Ubuntu or whatever it is on this node, we wanted to add a level of intelligence in there. So if customers have 10,000 nodes and are geographically dispersed, they're spread out all over the place, and they want to quickly determine where specific nodes are that have exact attributes. So let's say they have an Epic server. It has to meet this you know, 7300 server uh, Epic processor profile. You can go into Mojo, you can specify that, and Mojo will actually take those assets out of the CMDB, present those forward, and then you can then put that workload based on those very specific system constraints, right? So we uh, focus very much on allowing organizations to identify those assets very quickly and use those um, effectively. So from a workflow perspective, this is kind of what it looks like from a server provisioning standpoint. Um, the way we handle everything within um, the stack is we have um, a Yandex uh, relay that effectively runs on the platform um, when the system spins up. Uh, there's a one-time Pixie boot that goes out. It goes out and um, works and contacts Mojo. And then Mojo would then effectively start the Pixie one-time Pixie boot process. It would boot that OS into UFEI mode or if you have a CSM enabled, it would do a normal BIOS mode. And then it goes through a set of specific workloads, and we have those kind of like um, chained into a, a YAML format. So let's say you have um, 100 servers, and you want each server to have this exact profile. It has to have these BIOS settings. Like let's say you're a, a telco, and you have to make sure SIROV is enabled. Well, you can set that flag within that YAML, and then it'll go through, and it'll actually set those on the BIOSes within all those systems at the first step. And then once it's done with that, it then could go through storage and it would set specific attributes in the storage card. Set your RAID, your RAID arrays up. Um, and then once it's through that, uh, it effectively boots the OS, sets kickstart or pre-seed, and then that uh, effectively loads it onto the system, and it, in which time you can actually do a post uh, configuration through Ansible. So all of our configuration management and the processes that we do are through Ansible within the product. Oh yeah, and I was gonna mention, um, we had a lot of requests initially to do IPMI through this. Um, we we kind of pushed back on that just because a lot of concerns about security and IPMI and the fact that Redfish is REST enabled and you can actually do that through a secure socket. We try to enable as much functionality through Redfish as we can so we don't have to go back to a legacy uh, construct to manage the servers. Um, as far as use cases go, we, um, we're, we're, uh, we're focused in heavily in the data center, but we're also looking at edge-specific use cases, so um, organizations that are wanting to build full stacks, like let's say they want to put like a, a full Kubernetes stack, a rancher stack, whatever they're using, um, you can do that through our product within the service catalog, and effectively that would actually build up the OS footprints, and then it would build that stack on top of it. So if you wanted to build a whole open stack environment, that say has a certain amount of nodes, you would specify those within a resource pool. Once you do the specify in the resource pool, you can then build the entire environment um, into your data center through that uh, footprint. So um, I'm gonna go into the broadband service and we'll talk about it a little bit, because these, kind of, these two kind of connect together and we're kind of um, bringing these two products together for a very specific purpose and that is remote edge deployment and enabling bare metal services at the edge for customers. Um, so what is it um, effectively? It's a broadband service that we piloted in Bluemont, Virginia, and it's um, what I consider kind of 100% BSD-based in the, in the sense of BSD handles all the routing, it does all the firewalling. 
We do all the QoS through BSD. Um, and then we also have our core network and all the what we call micro pops and these smaller BSD instances actually run in those specific environments and we connect those together um, through standard routing construct through BIRD. Um, and when we look at that in the design principles, uh, Metify is very specific about uh, limiting the amount of complexity. Um, we found just a lot of the box solutions, they um, were overly complex. We wanted to keep it um, simple, stupid, or keep it stupid, simple, however you'd like to say that, but keep it as simple as possible. Um, focus on the user experience rather than kind of the latest, greatest thing. Um, you know, we wanted to kind of step back, take a step back and look at, you know, what was the problems that customers were experiencing when they had the initial deployments and how could we actually fix that, make it easier for the customers. So it was very much user, customer um, uh, focused experience. And then we also wanted to focus on how do we get this stuff out in the field and deployed as quickly as possible, but do a zero touch approach. So we focused on you know, automating the BSD stack and we, use our, we eat our own dog food, so we deploy that through Mojo, it does a full uh, free BSD deployment, zero touch and then um, brings it up to an operational state in which time the customer can actually start to use that asset in the field. Um, and then the other part is we just want to make sure that we're um, keeping up with the value and the price points because there's a lot of competition in this space. You know, Starlink's coming in, they're hitting the rural areas. Um, a lot of the 5G services are faster now, more um, spread out. So you're seeing the price points come down there as well. So we want to really focus on keeping the price point at a good, um, at a good level. So what were the challenges when we went to deploy this BSD infrastructure um, throughout the Blue Ridge? Um, we had a lot of issues, of course, with terrain. Um, very heavily wooded, hard to get signals through the trees, obviously. So we um, had to look at that. Um, we had a very limited budget. And one of the biggest complaints we had from customers was quality of service. You know, as they just couldn't get a consistent um, level of service. You know, the dreaded spinner they were seeing all the time. And uh, we wanted to figure out a way to actually eliminate that buffer bloat and actually give them a quality streaming experience. So we put a lot of focus on how we optimize the FreeBSD um, stack and some of the sys controls and things that we use to actually get it into a point where the customers can enjoy that st streaming experience. So uh, when we looked at the hardware, um, we, there were certain things that we wanted to make sure were in place. You know, we wanted to use higher quality NICs, so we didn't want to use a cheap one, so we used Intel i210s, uh, 320s, but we wanted to keep that box kind of in a sub $250 range. So we were able to do that, and we were able to put that into a smaller kind of like I, a mini ITX form factor, almost like a Nook form factor, so we could um, easily place that at the customer site, but we could also put it in a small constrained environment so it may have a box on the outside of a pole. Uh, where you just don't have a lot of power, you don't have a lot of space. So you want to keep it really, really small. Um, we ended up doing uh, FreeBSD 13.2, and most of the switching infrastructure was simple MicroTIC, just because the cost is low, and it tends to push packets fairly well. Um, and then on the monitoring side, it was Grafana, Telegraph, Prometheus, and Influx. Um, and I'll go a little bit into that. And then for the VPN for customers, we also gave them the WireGuard and, and OpenVPN options that they could use to make um, connections out. So what the footprint effectively look like and where do we put these small BSD pops? Um, we have one major one in Berryville, um, uh, Virginia. And as you can see in that picture up to the left-hand side there, it was a fairly significant install. We put it on top of a large commercial building and we had two points of presence. One was a point to point where we did symmetric full gig up to the top of the mountain. And then from there, we had actually um, um, span uh, via fiber and additional wireless micro pops. And then we also had a point to multi point where we actually uh, did a um, 160 degree um, five gigger signal to the side of the mountain that customers connect, could connect into. And at the top, what we did is we put um, these small free BSD instances um, in outdoor boxes. And I'll talk a little bit about that. It's an IP67 type of box that we put in the field that's full DC. And um, you could also plug in solar options for that for customers that might not have immediate accessibility to power. And we'd be able to put um, 100 or 2AH batteries on that. And then the customer would be able to sustain that um, remotely within the field. So what did it effectively look like when we were done? Um, the, the results were amazing. Like uh, we expected certain things, but when we actually implemented 
the, the latest uh, BSD install, um, and we did a lot of the optimizations with the, the focus of eliminating buffer bloat. What we're able to see through, you can see this um, um, nperf test, which is essentially, they go through a bunch of different users. It tells you how many have um, done the tests per month. Um, we're actually coming above most of the national average now for the, the overall streaming experience, which is kind of a cumulative thing. It's speed, it's latency, it's um, you know, how fast the video feeds are coming through, how consistent the video streaming experience is for the customer. And beyond that, um, we uh, also found that the buffer bloat was consistently within the highest, um, the highest level of um, efficiency. And that's one of the things that actually kills most of these connections is just the, the, where the uh, network interfaces and the buffers just can't keep up with the traffic. So the way we were able to do that is we implemented uh, PF with dummy net. Um, and that tend to work really well. And then um, the addition of BBR in there really helped out a lot. And then there's a, uh, probably, I don't know, probably about uh, 60 or 70 sys controls that we implemented that were specific to the network performance, but it was also consistent to tuning the Intel NICs um, specifically and TXQs and all that sort of stuff. So, um, so what we saw here is this isn't just one isolated instance of one customer. This is something that we're actually seeing across the board with all the customers that we implement the technology for on the hill. And what was nice about it is where you'd see a legacy service that would say, hey, I'm gonna you know, give you guys you know, 12 meg down and three meg up. Well, what's a customer gonna do with that? Nothing, you know, especially when they have to stream uh, um, video content and they're doing video conferencing, three meg up is not good. So what we did is we just opened up the entire symmetric gigabit pipe and then we allow customers to basically flex that bandwidth uh, during times when Customers might not be using it. One customer can use 80% of that pipe, and we're perfectly fine with it because we know dummy net and the implementation that we did within BSD is actually going to be able to handle that appropriately. So we're really excited about the results. And, and the other thing that was, I've been in this for a while, is the DMTS over Verizon, um, worked on that network quite a bit. And one of the things that I found interesting about this too is the level of uh, calls, and support from the customers is almost non existent. We just don't hear from the customers a lot of problems. In fact, I'm the only person that actually does support this specific network, and you know, I'm here for a couple days and haven't received any calls. So that's another part that we just, the user satisfaction is extremely high, and this is something we, that we weren't able to get when we were using um, the previous Linux implementation of, of the product. So very exciting. Um, so what's next on the roadmap? Um, in terms of what we, we plan on doing. Um, on the Mojo side, uh, there's a bunch of work that we're doing in the OCI uh, you know, to, to maybe do some testing and things like that. Um, but we would like to, uh, whenever that is viable, start to test moving our container infrastructure over to that and then complete the transformation into BSD because that is essentially the only thing that we really haven't done. Everything else has been effectively moved over. Um, additional areas of interest um, from us from more of a, a consumer standpoint of BSD is we would like to you know, continue to work on that improved uh, 4G, 5G um, cellular modem support. There's a lot of really good modem support already in BSD, um, but as the 5G NR stuff, the really high bandwidth stuff where you're seeing multi-gig speeds, those type of modems um, really do um, play into the whole you know, uh, mobile edge compute uh, in 5G strategy. So it'd be nice to see those modules effectively supported. Um, and then ultimately, uh, there's a few ways of managing these, uh, these modems. Um, you can simply do it through a sideband interface where you're actually connecting in through a serial interface, or you can use an MVIM or a QMI um, implementation, which allows you to connect um, through essentially an API within the modem. Now, OpenBSD does have that implemented within their stack, and it's quite useful, but it would be great to see something similar in BSD at some point. And then um, probably a little extra documentation on the MPD5 piece, because uh, you have the option to use an MPD5 or PPP for the, um, for the dialer. Uh, and then other things, like we're working a little bit with uh, NVIDIA around um, their Bluefield, which is their DPU. Um, and that's really exciting because um, a lot of the things like you know, TCP offload, um, being able to bootstrap specific OSs inside the card 
and then also network function virtualization and um, software-defined networking, all these things kind of come together within the Bluefield platform. So the improved support around that is, is, is pretty critical moving forward. Um, and then um, I would say on the VM Beehive uh, project, which we utilize within the Mojo stack, it's great from a management perspective. He's done a really good job keeping things simple. That project was, was moving along really well. And I think, can't remember, but I think they were looking for a maintainer. The maintainer's not um, specifically active in that. But that is probably one of the best implementations of um, orchestration and control of a virtual platform that I've seen from a command line. Um, and then other things like OCI and then the native um, .NET runtime um, would be other things from a consumer standpoint that we see as incredibly valuable. Um, so I guess with that so far, does anybody have any questions? Well, I don't see any questions. Oh, we have one? All right, cool. Sorry, did I see in one of your earlier slides that you have QCOW2 support in Beehive? Yeah, so no, we don't have it, but that was a feature that uh, we documented that would be great to have. <laughs> ah, got it. Yes. I agree. Yeah, <laughs> it'd be fantastic. Okay, well, I think that's all the questions we have. So okay. Thank you very much. Yes, it's been great. Thank you. Awesome. And I think we have a break now for about 30 minutes or so. Perfect. So, thanks. Cool. Thank thanks you. Everybody. Thank you.
Okay, folks, we're going to get ready for our next talk of the day. If we can make our way over to our seats. <laughs> that last little coffee test, there, Peter. Test. Hello. Yep. Does it work? Yes, you're on. <clears throat> so our next talk today is going to be from uh, Ruslan, talking about hardware tracing using trace events from the processor on FreeBSD. All right. So my name is Ruslan Bukin. I'm working in the University of Cambridge Computer Laboratory. I'm working on the projects around uh, ARM Morello SOC mostly covering uh, basic platform support, but also doing some cherry bits. Um, so uh, one, uh, I, um, so I initially I made support for IOMMU for this platform and uh, SCMI and I wrote uh, display controller drivers and uh, GPU our Mali GPU Panfrost driver. And uh, in January, I was looking what else I could work on. Like, I was looking what uh, peripheral support we are missing in the ARM Morello SOC. And I found that we are missing uh, a hardware trace unit that is included to the ARM Morello SOC. And <clears throat> so I found that we don't have any framework in FreeBSD that could cover such kind of technologies, like hardware trace technologies. And I decided to start a new project, which is called HWT. So I plan to talk about HWT today, and uh, at the end, I plan to show a demo. So just to start, this is a first ever produced Morella board. It was shipped directly to my house where I was working on display controller drivers and GPU driver. I also wrote PCI Express driver for this platform and probably something else that I forgot to, to mention. A few months later, I was playing Doom on our Morello board with 3D acceleration. Um, this is available on the YouTube on my channel as, as long as some other videos uh, by the way, other, my other contributions to FreeBSD include uh, RIS-5, ISA support that I did in 2015, and also Intel SJX support for x86, and lots of drivers for FreeBSD. But today I'll be talking about HWT, about tracing. So there are a few tracing technologies available in uh, modern CPUs. I believe every mobile and every laptop in this room has at least one of these technologies. So we are talking about Intel Processor Trace, which is a x86 technology uh, present on a every modern uh, Intel CPU, I think. I think it's available since uh, Broadwell, uh, which is 2016, I think, 2014 and Apollo Lake, which is Intel Pentium, uh, Teleron, CPUs. Um, there's also ARM Core SI technology that I found in ARM Morello SOC. It is quite old technology introduced uh, like 24 years ago. And there are many, many generations and versions of that. And also ARM Statistical Profile Annex Station that is also present in ARM Morello and uh, probably all modern uh, ARM64 CPUs. There are probably more technologies that I'm not aware of. So this tree is what I'm currently looking at. So uh, let's talk about main uh, principle, principle of operation. So basically, this kind of technologies, they collect information about software execution and store it into DRAM in a highly compressed format. They, st they store it as this information as uh, e events. So it's like 
a packet which is also called an event. And these events, they uh, basically covers everything about software execution and uh, the information that they stored into the DRAM. Uh, it is supposed that it will be enough for you to restore entire program flow of, the, of your application. So every time your application make a branch, like uh, calling a function, jumping somewhere, this event will be stored into DRAM in a very small amount of data. Um, basically, uh, all exceptions, all interrupts, and you can configure this tracing you need to also include timestamps, like you can specify uh, how often do you want to see these timestamps into the trace. And also you can insert this, the events uh, by yourself in this, from a software if you want. And uh, for every branch taken, there will be, or taken or not taken, there will be one bit of information stored into DRAM. And, well, your application makes lots of lots of jumps and branches, and uh, your like space in DRAM could be filled up very quickly. Like you can get, if you enable lots of these events, uh, like gigabytes of uh, information per second stored into DRAM. So I'm, I, also, I only done support for the ARM core side. Intel process trace and statistical profile and extension, this is currently that we are looking at with contributors to the HWMT framework. So the um, core side subsystem is quite large. It, will, it, it did require to write a separate framework just for a core side because it consists of uh, multiple components. There are several devices that every, uh, each of devices require like a separate driver. And uh, this device is attached on ACPI, Flight device 3 bus. So every device is described in your, in your device tree source file or ACPI table. And this is just a simple example how the data flow could uh, um, go like, uh, the embedded trace macro cell device, which is part of the core side uh, IP uh, per each uh, core is producing the trace and then trace is collected and uh, funneled into the single stream. So all uh, traces from every CPU will be sent to the single buffer by using a funnel device. And then they could be replicated uh, to the several output uh, devices. It could be output to the external port or to the uh, TMC controller, which is a device that receives data and stores it to the DRAM. And this is very simplified uh, pipeline. Uh, the pipeline depends on your system on crystal. It could be much larger, it could be several replicators, several funnels. All of these devices and the interconnection is described in the device tree source. So you have to build the entire pipeline before you can actually use it. So I mean that if you want to enable tracing on core side, you have to first enable and configure your TMC, set up the buffers where you want this traces, tracing to be put. Then you want to go to replicator, set up it, enable it. Then we go to funnels, enable it. And then you go to embedded trace macro cell for every CPU that you're interested in. You also enable it, flash caches, and uh, do the other stuff. So <laughs> this is like a separate framework that is already committed to FreeBSD. Uh, I did this like a few years ago, looking at the, uh, another project, but it is not in use currently because we didn't have a framework. Um, And this TMC component of core side, it has bugs. So I'm currently working not with the latest version of core side, I think uh, version four, which is uh, uh, originally uh, uh, produced in 2015, but uh, they have a minor versions of it. So I'm working with uh, ARM core side, like uh, probably about 2018. Uh, and uh, the problem with that, 
TMC component that it doesn't have any interrupt line. So you are filling your buffers, you run your application, and uh, once your put buffers filled up and they filled up quite quickly, you will not be interrupted. And the hardware start of writing the buffers from the beginning. So this is how <laughs> ARM Core SI TMC works. Uh, they fixed these bugs in the latest version, so in latest SOCs that will be uh, interrupt line provided. But in my case, I don't have it. Um, and also Linux also support doesn't, have, doesn't use any interrupt line on uh, ARM Core SI tracing units. So what the solution could be here? Well, we could allocate very large buffers. Like this technology supports scatter gather operation, so we could allocate as much as we want. Like we can allocate gigabytes of memory, like if you have them. Um, and I forgot to say that uh, there is actually no way to stop the tracing. So if you tracing a single application, a single thread of the application, if, if you enable tracing um, when the application switches into the CPU, and then you will like want to pause the tracing when you, the scheduler switches your application out from CPU, but the TMC doesn't allow you that. So you, it, it will be stopped, and you will not be able to uh, continue tracing from some point, in some place in the DRAM. So Linux do some workarounds for these problems. I didn't go that much, I just uh, allocating a large pieces of data, of memory that is and like supposedly be enough for my buffers, uh, for my applications, and uh, this, I think it works. Intel processor trace is much better technology that I, I was looking at it uh, uh, previously, and it has completely independent pipeline, so CPU takes a trace and puts it to DRAM directly, immediately, without any, uh, uh, funnel on it or replicating it anywhere. And this allows us to allow multiple users to trace um, multiple applications at the same time. And unlike uh, ARM Core side, this is not memory mapped peripheral. So if you want to enable tracing setup, pointers to the buffers, you do this by issuing uh, CPU instructions. So you have to issue CPU instructions on the CPU that you want to enable tracing for. Again, the technology is very similar to ARM Core side. You basically set up which packets do you want, and the type of packets are roughly the same. You want, for example, to see where, you branch, you, where your application branches to, so you want to enable target IP event, and it will be stored to DRAM by, using, by Intel PT. And it also can store taken or not taken branches, and uh, using PT write command, you can write any data you want from your application, and pretty much everything will be stored to, as events to DRAM, including power state, entry, exit, and all exceptions, all interrupts, non mask interrupts pretty much everything. And the third technology is ARM statistical profiling extension. extension. Uh, and this is a bit different because uh, it uses statistical approach. So it's like uh, sampling profile approach. Uh, like while the previous two technologies, they store gigabytes of data per second, this is different. Um, this will uh, make a sample, like you can set up what time, what the delay you want to have between samples. And uh, this technology uh, allows you to detect some varied usage, varied cache usage patterns like uh, false sharing uh, uh, problems. Like when you uh, work with different data but this data use the same cache line. This is quite new technology introduced recently in RV8.2. It's optional technology, so it may not present in every SOC. Uh, 
also let, uh, let's compare this to the HDL and PMC because with HDL PMC, for example, you want to you can uh, see how much, for example, cache operations like cache misses occurred while your application run, and you can find the place where the um, cache uh, is used as most. But with HDL PC, you'll not be able to find uh, what that data is actually your place in a kernel or anywhere is accessing to. So you'll find the place in the, in the code where this uh, situation happens, but you will not be able to find the place what's actually destination of load stores where this uh, data goes to. So the kernel support, I started in January. I think it takes for me like six months. I'm currently already on another project, working on another project, but entire support is about 3.5 lines of code. And um, uh, similar to HDL PMC, we had to install some kernel hooks, like uh, for MMAP, we need to know where the dynamic libraries, for example, of user space applications are mapped to. So we need to catch this uh, information and store it somewhere. We also need to ensure we get notifications when a, when a new thread is created for the applications that we are tracing currently. Uh, or if some new kernel module is loaded and when scheduler switches in our application to a CPU so we can enable tracing and switches out so we can disable tracing. And uh, all this bunch of hooks that are very similar to HDL PMC hooks uh, have to be installed in the kernel. And uh, HDLT uh, have a character device dev HDLT that is basically allow allowing you to uh, set up the tracing. It allows you basically just one operation to create a tracing context. And obviously, this platform supports, this framework supports multiple uh, backends at the same time. So if you have it on both core side and a statistical profiling extension, they both could be registered in the framework. So with character device dev HWT, you basically creating uh, a software context of the, of your, of your uh, tracing application, of your tracing session. And there are two modes of operation, which is, which is similar to HDL PMC. We have tracing and thread mode uh, that allowing us to trace uh, any given application in user space and be able to trace uh, any particular thread of the application. And also a CPU mode. So we dynamically, once a context uh, session, context, uh, HDL PMC context created, we dynamically uh, create a new character device that is allowing us to manage this tracing session. So in thread mode, we'll be HDLT underscore uh, the I, uh, unique ident ID identification that is uh, created by the kernel and the thread ID. So you could, uh, when you're tracing your application, you can uh, then decode tracing for any, any uh, given uh, thread that you are interested in. And in CPU mode, we are basically tracing whatever CPU activity in kernel mode. So it will be a new character device created, HWT underscore uh, CPU, the CPU ID that we are interested in. Obviously, we can enable tracing for all the CPUs, but it will be a lot of data. And once uh, this uh, character device is created, you could uh, obviously um, memory map the buffers into the user space. And uh, you could also issue, I issue IOCTLs on that char character devices to control your tracing session. Like you can start the tracing, you can get records that are basically information that is collected by using hooks. Like if some libraries map it somewhere, uh, you can um, receive this information into the user space that will allow you 
to make a simple lookup in the IP addresses uh, that is collected by the hardware. You can also set configuration because these technologies, they uh, obviously ev every technology has its own kind of configuration, lots of lots of registers that you can configure for your particular case uh, in a kernel and uh, we could not make like uh, like general approach here because there's lots, lots of uh, registers um, and lots of configuration bits that you can set. And um, you could also, uh, using IFTLs, read the current pointer in the buffer. So the hardware is filling the buffer, like your gigabyte of buffer, and you could see where the hardware is currently filling the buffer, in which place, so you could take it all previous place from the buffer and, for example, analyze it. And then you take the pointer again and see how much further it go and take the second chunk of memory and uh, process it. And there is another call called IOC wake up. It's basically made to wake up the threads that are put to sleep. So the problem is that when we start in our application and we want to do a simple lookup, we actually don't know where uh, runtime linker mapped our libraries and our main executable to. So we couldn't actually configure the tracing you need. For example, if you want to limit the range, like uh, set up IP range filtering, like if you don't want to trace entire application, but maybe you want to trace just single function, we need to know where our executable are actually mapped in the virtual address space and uh, set config for this particular IP range that we're interested in. So this uh, special function of the HDLT is that put our target application to sleep on every MMAP request. So when you start an application, it does lots of MMAPs to MMAP all the libraries, sleep C, all the stuff that is using. And every time it, it is doing that, we will, is putting it to sleep. Then we collect information and ship it to user space. So user space could figure out what actually to do is it information provided is enough for us to start tracing or do we need a more do we expect more uh, map calls to uh, configure IP range filtering and continue tracing for our application so the tracing session is stored in the struct HDLT context that pretty much contain everything about the mode of operation about everything about our session like when a thread created of our target application, we allocate or, or, or runtime uh, buffers for it, and we create a new HDLT thread and we store it, in this tra store it into the tracing context. Also, informa information about the backend that is actually used, like Coresite, the statistical profile extension, or Intel PT. Uh, in case of uh, CPU mode, it stores, stores uh, CPU structs, like with some information as well, like buffers, CPU ID, and other stuff. So everywhere we operate with this HDLT context. And obviously, you can make multiple contexts at the same time as uh, run, uh, when you trace in the application, or you, uh, multiple users could actually make different sessions. And uh, we also um, create uh, several hash tables that allowing us to quickly look up a context. For example, if scheduler want to switch uh, an application to a CPU, and we, at this time, we need to check if we actually have tracing context configured to trace this application. So we made a quickly context, uh, HDLT context hash lookup with a key uh, of uh, address of the actual struct proct in, in FreeBSD. And we can quickly see if a tracing session is configured for that. And if it's configured, we can ch check the mode of the tra trace session and enable a uh, specific backend, uh, set up buffers and all that stuff. And we also maintain the owner hash, which is um, a similar hash with HDLT owner struct, which is um, 
basically information about the application that is uh, requesting that trace session. So if that application dies for some reason, we could uh, clean up everything quickly in the kernel. So uh, don't store something that we don't need. So this framework, obviously, it requires not just uh, kernel support, but also user space instrumentation tools. And um, these tools, they, uh, so what we need from them, we need to basically specify what application we want to trace, like which what mode of operation. We want to stop address range filtering. And we need to use specific for this platform trace decoder. And uh, we need actually to start our, to fork our uh, application and uh, to manage this process. And also, if you want, like, to make the output human readable form, we actually need to make also symbol lookup so we could see what IP, current IP, like, that is stored by hardware into DRAM, uh, what function name it corresponds to. So I made this HWT uh, user space application that is doing all that stuff. And there are two decoders. I'm not sure about decoder for the um, ARM statistical profiling extension, but for the ARM core site, it's ARM open CSD, large decoder written on C++. And also for the Intel processor trace, it is Intel lib IPT. Both of them I already com committed to the contrib directory. So they, I think, already built uh, when you build a, uh, a kernel. I'm not sure about that. They are not used currently because the framework is not yet in um, FreeBSD base system. So here are a few examples. Like we could uh, just start tracing for the uname application. Or let's say we are interested in the main function of the uname application, which is second example. In this case, HWT instrumentation tool will fork the uname. It will receive information from kernel where this uname is mapped to, where its library is mapped to, where the main executable is mapped to. And uh, it will set up address range filtering in the hardware, so hardware does not put everything to the DRAM, that all information that we do not not interested in. And it will enable tracing only for this particular IP range. And then we could uh, have much less data to analyze. Obviously, we could trace all the dynamic libraries that are linked with our application. We could also trace in kernel mode, specifying which CPU IDs we want to trace, like for example, in this example we want to trace CPU ID 0 and CPU ID 2, and we want to trace CPU switch function that is scheduler uh, calls when it wants to switch threads. Obviously we can also trace kernel modules. In this example we are tracing if IVM and a function named packet takes so what's current status? Uh, ARM Core site is fully functional, it works. I actually uh, like it. Um, and uh, my colleague in ARM, Zachary Leaf, is working on statistical profiling station support for this platform. So ARM officially supports this framework and uh, Zachary uh, working half time uh, to bring SP support to the HWT so we have a second um, uh, tracing technology supported. And I think he already reported that he has uh, CPU mode support. So not a thread mode, but we already able to profile in a CPU mode in kernel. Um, Intel PT work is just started by Boyan. Uh, he, uh, I met him on Coimbra and he said that he's interested to support this and he just wrote me a, an email recently uh, informing that he started to look at this uh, Intel PT work and I provided to Boyan some snippets uh, 
that I made uh, previously. So this work is on review currently. The patch is quite large. Uh, so I think it will be on review for a while, maybe when we uh, add SPE as well to the review, maybe some more people will be interested in that, hopefully. And now I am ready to show a demo. So here I just log it into the Cherry BSD system. It's uh, working on Arm Morella in my office in England. So here's the instrument instrumentation tool edge DLT. I just my uh, issue to make. And uh, as you see, it builds HDLT core site, module, some processing files, ELF, uh, and link it with open CSD decoder, libxo. Uh, and we are also using libpmc start library to make a symbol lookup. So I'm running. Uh, HWT, and let's say I want to trace your name, user bin your name. Command not found. Here it is. So we receive three records from kernel, like it is informing us that libc is address where it's mapped to, runtime linker, and the main executable. With this information, we could make simple lookup. Like we get IP addresses from, uh, IP addresses of, branch, of uh, branches where the, our application is branches to. So this PCs is basically a place where our uh, control flow changes to. And using symbol lookup, we can see that this is DL iterate with offset 184. So this is where our application started to work. And it started with runtime linker. So there is lots and lots of stuff that runtime linker is doing, like some calculating some digest dynamic, relocating itself somewhere, doing mem set, lots and lots of stuff before actually it reaches you name. So there's quite a lot of packets. I don't know, let's calculate how many packets. Like 8,000 packets for the simple you name applications that just basically just makes a single printf. So we need to find where is our you name is here in this trace. So we, we basically get a call trace of entire scene Here it is. So this is probably libc runtime underscore start of the u name. And here is we jump it to the main function of the u name. So it does some work like print. So the u name is called print u name. And some offset from and print your name, so does it work? And that is it, it's done. <laughs> so it makes a single print and just close. But we had to do lots and lots of stuff in the runtime linker. So what else we could do? We could actually see the row trace because this is already decoded stuff. So there's quite a lot of data in our trace. There's lots of atom packets that contains that bit I told about. Basically bit if the branch is taken or not taken. Uh, 
So this is more like road trace. It's still decoded, but it's, it's not in human readable form, I think. And obviously, we can configure this core site. We could hide. It's easily hackable. We could uh, just open the core site C and uh, maybe enable, disable some packet types and uh, configure it for the our case, like when we are debugging on or looking for some issue in the software that uh, we are using. And we can also trace the kernel. So we could specify that we want to trace CPU zero. And we want to uh, trace kernel. And let's say we want to trace CPU switch function. So Tracing units only enabled the IP range of CPU switch. And here is lots and lots of CPU switches happens by CPU zero. So this is kind of interesting and uh, helpful framework because I didn't do any modifications to the, uh, to the software. I didn't make any changes to the CPU switch right to see this information. And uh, as you see, there is timestamp packets around every CPU switch call. So we could actually see how much time the CPU switch take, taken, right? We could just uh, take this value, take this value, subtract, and we could see how much time we spend in every single CPU switch. And we could see the places in the CPU switch where the control flow changes to, like 74, then it's go to B8 and 7, 7C. So basically about five branches. Uh, what else? So this uh, tool allows you to store raw trace into the file or decode the trace into the file. There are some options, not many, but there is something that is already helpful. But I think uh, uh, we kind of need to improve this, maybe uh, to make some histograms or something like allowing us to see how much time every single function is called, for example. We already can do this by using so like shell scripts, like, you know, sort unique, all that stuff, and uh, uh, see which function in our application called the most. But if you make like more uh, options to the HDLT and uh, teach HDLT to do that, that will be even better. So that is it. Any questions? <clears throat> no one understand anything? <laughs> Thank you very much, Rissan. Oh, we have one? All right. <clears throat> Come in. Uh, those timestamps look to be in hex for those nanoseconds. I think this, uh, uh, like, how's it called in GIFs? Like, the clock. I, I think they are in a clock. Uh, in a clock unit. So, whatever you know, generic timer of ARM64 operates with, like, uh, I think yeah, I think maybe CPU cycles. Uh, I'm not sure exactly. <laughs> Okay. Well, thank you very much, Ruslan. Thank you. All right. So let's do a bit of a shorter break because I've had several people ask to do talks in our lightning talk session. So I'm, I'm going to start at 3.45 instead of 4. So let's break. You can run for our last break here for the day. Use the restroom or grab the snacks if they're still there. And we'll start again at 3.45.
Everyone's sleeping. Oh, sorry.
All right, so we've come to our final session for today, um, which we described as uh, our lightning round. So we have several different talks, some of them shorter than others, that we're going to kind of go as quickly as we can with our goal of getting out of here by five. So just kick us off um, is Michael Dexter, who's going to talk to us about his work with BSC CAN. And I think it wants, it's uh, not happy with the keyboard. <laughs> but when you're ready, Michael. Testing one, two, three. OK, thank you. Oh, keyboard assistant, thank you. Quit. Don't need that. Hello, my name is Michael Dexter. I've met quite a few of you. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, finally, a vendor summit after 16 years of giving talks at conferences around the world from EuroBSD on Strasbourg onward. I can talk about my company, but I'm not here to talk about that, so that can be maybe next year. I also host three production user calls every week. There is Jails, followed by ZFS, followed by Beehive. Those have been very active. Take a peek at beehive.org. That will link to everything you need to find, but I'm not here to talk about that today. I'm here to give you an update on BSD CAN 2024 with a theme of giving back. Thank you, Dan Langell. Uh, show of hands if you don't know who that is. Statistically, that is possible, but he's been organizing BSD CAN for 19 years straight, nearly single-handedly, which is amazing. And 2024 will be the 20th anniversary. So he has thought, well, 20 years is plenty. He will still be involved. He has pledged to do the auction, and some of you will know exactly what that means. And uh, he has begat a program committee led by Michael W. Lucas, and a number of us including Alan Jude, who looks like he vanished, uh, and Colin Percival, Diane Bruce, Pamela, uh, Greg Leahy, David Maxwell, all these familiar faces, uh, Hanstein, Adam, you name it, Andrew, myself. So uh, Michael cornered me and said, you own a suit, you must do the fundraising promotion. So I'm like, this is not a suit, it's just a sports coat, but such is life. We have dates. May 29th and 30th for the tutorials and other meetings. There are still opportunities at this early date to have a full day event prior to the tutorials. And then the traditional conference tracks on the 31st and 1st. Please do not shoot the messenger. I apologize in advance if it falls on a graduation, a marathon, CANSAC, or importantly, the Edmonton Five Pin Bowlers Association Ottawa Tournament, which is taking place that weekend. Uh, last year it fell on Victoria Day. That was a really bad idea because everything cost about twice as it should have. So the theme of giving back. Uh, FreeBSD Foundation, thank you for making this happen and countless other things. Show of hands, any donors in the room? Anyone, anyone? Okay, two, three, four, okay. Uh, essential, essential work. Uh, NetApp made this happen also with the foundation. Thank you, NetApp, I appreciate that. <laughs> Applause in back, hold on, uh, come on. <laughs> okay. Now, thank you, NetApp, for Beehive. I think I lost the slide there. Anyway. Uh, Beehive is awesome. Uh, it sounds like I need to reintroduce NetApp to Beehive because it's this amazing technology they begat and aren't using. And let's talk about it. It came up many times in the calls and the presentations here. Fantastic work. But NetApp didn't write Beehive. Four individuals wrote Beehive. Individuals are very important. Developers like Peter Neal, Anish, and Leon. And so, you know, all of you really, really matter a lot more than you think. And you may have a company name on your, on your cool hoodie, but your individual contributions are huge. I cannot underemphasize that. So super quick question about uh, BSD CAN. Uh, I trust some of you attended. I've seen many of you there for years and years and years. Has BSD CAN helped your project, your work, what you're hacking on, show of hands, anyone? A little bit, a little tiny bit, Peter Wham, okay, good, good, good. Has it helped your career? There's a whole lot of hallway track, a lot of FaceTime, a lot of, hey, uh, I'm, what was the term, uh, green gardening, where you're leaving, you're on your way out of a company in the UK, but you're available on the market, so that event plays a key role in those circles. So, Thank you, 
Foundation, Annette, up for this event. Thank you for Annette. Uh, Beehive, these slides got jumbled, that's okay. Uh, thank you, NetApp, for exemplary donations. Uh, you take a look at the foundation page. NetApp is squarely at the top. Wham, right there, and they've been doing that consistently. Thank you for that. If it hasn't been said, thank you for that. Also, in my time with Beehive, Peter pointed out from his time at NetApp that NetApp has one of the most diverse workforces he's seen in the industry. And that is something to be applauded. That is awesome. I've spoken to 12 uh, developer, kernel developers of 12 years. Yes, I'm looking at you who uh, I guarantee have topics up their sleeves to present at an event like BSD can. It, it follow the format of what you saw here today. It need not be high stress. It, it's awesome. So I'm happy to help you with proposals. I've helped many people with them, format them, and just Try it out. Uh, it's always good to start small with a local event and work your way up to something like BSD CAN. If you like what you see here, please apply when the CFP opens up in December. So I'd love to see that event and every other BSD CON mirror that diversity. So again, hats off. So giving back, uh, luckily Dan had saved up money pre-pandemic, which was very helpful post-pandemic, and we pretty much drained the BSD CAN coffers. Every BSD CON needs help with fundraising and money, you name it. Uh, Sato-san is fundraising fun. <laughs> He's just smirking. And it's a challenge. Many of us are very technical and maybe not uh, good at reaching out to vendors. So I think we have to just rethink what we've been doing for 20 years. There are huge successes, but there's also times when it's like, well, let's hope the vendors get paid on time, et cetera, et cetera, and people reimbursed, you name it, but generally it's all worked out in the end, but it's always stressful. So hopefully we can together come up with funding models that just make it institutional to help out the events and make them sustainable, because hey, 20 years in, lots of happy people, let's look to the next 20 years. So that said, about giving back, things have gotten expensive. I have three kids and a spouse, Fast food is now like 40 to 80 bucks, and dinner at a proper restaurant is over 100 bucks, and that, I, that's outside my control, but we do what we gotta do. And I did some math, that Pete's Coffee, coffee across the way with like a scone is about 1250, and if you were to get coffee once a year at Pete's Coffee for 20 years, it's about 250 bucks, which sounds like a huge amount of money, but 1250 is like kind of the norm. Coffee was a lot cheaper when we were all younger, but let's not talk about that. So, here and now, I'm happy to put in 250 if someone else will. Is there anyone else who's willing to do that whole 1250 over 20 years? I'm, I'm sure to be here you have a reasonable uh, income, just saying. And if you don't like what I'm asking, give it to the foundation. <laughs> just send it right their way. Uh, so if anyone's game, I'm happy to put personally 250 in at the moment I put down this clicker. Is anyone willing to join me doing that? Okay. Uh, in those situations, talk to your team, send around a hat, and if you each put in, say, 50 bucks on a team of 10 people, that adds up really quickly. At NetApp, it's difficult to uh, shame the boss because they are the exemplary donors in the community. So there's that. But in many companies, I'm hearing a lot of talk of the new merger, the acquisition, the this, the that, oh, the cutting back. But the money's there. So I hope we can each get that word out there. Uh, all things considered, this is not that expensive. And uh, BSD CAN's unique in that it provides travel uh, reimbursements and accommodation, so it's actually a really, really good value. So uh, you'll see that address bopping around on the internet, funding at bsdcan.org. It may ask you for a name, Dan Langell, uh, USA if it asks. You can talk to me at Dexter at BSD Fund about raising money through companies that have benefited from the wonderful technologies of FreeBSD, because this last two days has been an amazing showcase of what FreeBSD can do and especially in the context of the alternatives. And with multi-decade experience of like well 
had we picked another OS back in the day, we, we would not be where we are. So I thank you in Canadian. <laughs> thank you for your attention. And uh, I'm relatively easy to find. Any questions? Well, so <clears throat> I think Simon is next for oh. our lightning round here. Testing one, two, three, good. Um, I'm gonna to talk today about Secure Boot. I'm gonna use Junos as my example, but almost everything that I'm talking about here, is, all, all the code I think in, in question is in upstream. Um, I'm gonna gloss through a lot of the details because I've given talks about them before uh, at BSD CAN. Um, although I just realized that I didn't give a talk on very exec, I think Steve K may have, but if, if need be, I can recap some of that if anybody's interested. Um, quick agenda, so I'm gonna go through uh, why, firstly why. Um, lots of bad actors out there. Um, there was a recent case in, I think it was the UK, a bunch of teenagers doing fun stuff like offering bribes on social media to say, hey, we'll give you $20,000 if you give us access to your VPN, or we'll give you $100,000 if you give us keys to this, that, and the other, that sort of thing. So um, much as we all like to write secure code and so on, one of your biggest threats is um, potentially inside your organization. Um, secure infrastructure is becoming more and more important. The internet is not the fun place it was back when the Morris Worm came out. And a number of governments, the UK already will fine network providers uh, hefty amounts if their network and therefore their customers are compromised due to lack of keeping security patches up to date. So all of us uh, in the embedded industry uh, need to get uh, quite serious about securing our infrastructure. So what is Secure Boot? Um, very briefly, it's a process where each step in the boot process verifies the next step before executing it. Um, so you have an initial firmware, it doesn't really matter what, what that firmware is, but in, in the FreeBSD context, the initial firmware verifies the loader, the FreeBSD loader. The loader verifies the kernel, the rootFS, and everything else that it reads. Um, in our case, we then run a pre-boot script that will initialize verified exec, um, and we do that to ensure that that's all up and running before anything that anybody but us can provide input to gets a chance to run. And then we also do things in etc. RC and friends uh, to make sure that all of that stuff is verified, and that's, that's possibly the main topic for today because that's the stuff that's relatively new to anybody who's attended my talks in the past. Um, it's also very important to keep in mind that a verified kernel is only a good start. A lot of people who talk about we have secure boot, what they really mean is we've verified our kernel and that's end of story. Um, that, that's a good start but it's nowhere near um, a secure system. Um, Firmware examples, uh, we have things that do um, uh, BIOS slash UFI. Those things typically use some DB and DBX um, keys to verify the kernel, the grub or loader and so on. Uh, DBX is used to revoke keys. So for instance, uh, we provide 
uh, dev keys and production keys for our BIOS and some customers like to be able to revoke the dev key so that they can be assured that their, their systems will only ever run the production releases of software. Uh, it's quite a good idea. Um, we keep the, the BIOS keys for, um, in HSMs, currently at least. Um, I'll talk more about HSMs in a minute. Um, and uh, a lot of the non-x86 platforms we have uh, use U-Boot or U-Boot emulating UFI. Um, and on at least one particular platform, we had them, or we did it, I guess, for them, uh, modify U-Boot so that instead of using whatever uh, you know, DB type key stuff that it was using to verify U-Boot, it would use our libsecure boot that we use in the loader to verify the loader and because this was a joint venture situation and we didn't want to have to go to um, the, the, part, the partner to get the loader signed every time we wanted to be able to update it. So by putting that extra code into U-Boot, it made it relatively painless for us to update the loader um, as needed. Um, and the U-Boot, we, we don't anticipate needing to update nearly as often. The verifying loader, um, I, I, I gave a talk at BSD CAN, I think, in 2018 on this, so I'll, I'll, I, can, I can answer questions if anybody's interested, but I'll, I'll just gloss over this quickly. We use embedded trust anchors in, in all of our stuff. That's, as an embedded vendor, that's the easiest way for us to manage it. There is code that um, one of the other um, contributors to FreeBSD added to it so that it can load trust anchors from the UFI ESP. Um, you can also uh, have the loader load additional trust anchors from a verified package. You can also use that same mechanism to revoke um, keys. Uh, so again, uh, it, back to the, the idea of having production and uh, development keys, uh, we provide a little package for people if they want to they can install that package and as the loader is booting, it will effectively revoke the development key so that they can guarantee their system will only boot production packages. Uh, we use X5, uh, X5 and 9 um, certificate chains to do, verify our stuff, but we also have uh, provision for using OpenPGP, which for a lot of organizations, if you don't already have an extensive PKI, PKI uh, OpenPGP is a much uh, easier thing to get into. Um, the manifests uh, that it reads contain hashes of all the files. Um, and simple files like loader.conf, um, foo.forth or foo.lua and so on, these are all hashed before they're read. Um, that's that's uh, double the, the I.O., but typically those files are very small, so that's a very simple um, strategy. For the larger files, like the kernel, the modules, um, the root of S, and so on, those are all loaded as a, uh, hashed as a side effect of reading them. Uh, that greatly reduces the overhead, but it also was a much more invasive change to the loader to make that work. Um, we do allow unverified input. Um, so, for instance, uh, we provide for customers to be able to um, provide uh, additional hints and stuff like that. So there's a number of files that can be unverified, but we, if, if we deal with anything that's unverified, we'll restrict what you can set with it. So you can't set any of the variables that would influence what you're going to boot. Um, but you can set, it, it's useful but for being able to set debug flags and things like that. Uh, and the same goes for interactive input at the loader prompt. So you can't set the thing you're going to boot at the loader prompt. Um, a quick aside about packages in Junos, just because it's, I, it, it'll help some of the, the subsequent explanation. Um, in modern Junos, the, each package is, um, a package, by the way, is just an archive with some meta info. And in our case, the meta info is a package.xml that provides all the description of the package. We have a manifest that contains all the hashes of the, the content of the package. Um, we have a certificate chain, typically, for verifying it, and a, a detached signature. 
and for our bundle packages, the outermost package that gets installed, uh, they will often have multiple detached signatures so that if you're installing it on a much older version of Junos that doesn't necessarily know how to verify ECDSA signatures but knows how to do RSA signatures, then it'll pick the one that it understands. Um, <clears throat> most of our packages, uh, the bulk of their content is in a compressed ISO image and um, along with a, a list of sim links that they want to make into that. And that's why uh, we talk about mounting packages. Um, some of them also have um, a boot subdirectory containing kernel modules or loader.conf and so on. This is important because it allows us to have multiple packages contributing to the boot environment. We don't, we don't have to try and make a monolithic loader.conf work, which is very difficult to do if you want it to be signed. Um, we have some trick fourth code that uh, makes the loader able to just read all this stuff from all over the place. Um, and as I say, the avoiding a monolithic loader.conf uh, is very handy. The, uh, the rootfs, uh, so we always have a rootfs. It's, again, it's a compressed ISO image. The, the kernel package, it's loader.conf, um, sets those variables so that uh, we're going to um, chirrut into the place where we mounted the real file system. Uh, we're going to run that pre-boot script that I mentioned. It's going to initialize um, uh, stuff. And we also set the, the knobs and so on to say, if anything goes wrong, don't offer to let them pick some other root file system to mount. Uh, it's, it's that or nothing. Again, the, the, the pre-boot will FS key, mount the storage, initialize very exec, and then it'll also mount some critical packages that then let us do the rest of the show. Uh, and key in that is initializing verified exec. Um, and very briefly, uh, this is, there's a, a loader, imaginatively called very exec. Um, it verifies and loads manifests for each file entry in a manifest. It'll resolve that to a, a file descriptor, sends that down to the kernel along with here's the hash, uh, here's some flags that may or may not be associated with it, and in some cases, here's a Mac label that we also want to associate with that file. And that's important for some of the other Mac modules that we do, um, which was also talked about at um, BSDCAN. Um, some of the interesting flags there, uh, indirect is, is a cool one if you want to be able to run signed Python scripts on your box, but you don't like the idea of people being able to run interactive Python and ef effectively have a complete SDK to to run on your box, which is largely defeats the point of doing signed binaries, because you've just given them the keys to the castle. Um, the hashes can be any of the, the NIST approved um, hashes. Unfortunately, we're constrained to use uh, NIST approved algorithms for all this sort of stuff. Um, but I, I think most people are reasonably happy with, with these. OK. so. Here's where it starts to, to get more interesting, I guess. Um, and um, when we run etc. RC, uh, we do a number of things in um, RC subra and such to allow us to make sure that we're only running verified uh, scripts from RC.d. Um, we, at the same time, we want to be able to allow customers to throw files into rcconf.d, for example, to enable debugging of something when they're having a problem. But there's, you, you can think of there's, there's a number of categories of, of scripts that you run during your, your, your boot process. There's some that you consider you know, critical to the security of your box. And for those, we modified the, uh, what's the function called? Um, the thing that loads your configuration, we allow you to pass an option to it to say, I will only take a configuration that's been verified. And if you can't verify that, then I won't read it. Um, the other big thing that we do that's different to upstream is, uh, so stock FreeBSD does two passes through rc.d. There's an initial one until you get the file systems mounted, and then you go and reevaluate the list 
to take into account RC.d scripts which now have appeared on the file systems that you just mounted. We do that, but we also uh, have to take into account third-party packages. So we, we end up doing up to four passes through RC.d. We have the initial, uh, the initial pass where we're only gonna mount our core packages, and when we do that, we tell verified exec um, not to allow any extensions. We have a number of extensions that allow you to do things like loading third-party um, trust anchors and stuff like that. So we disable all that during the early uh, phases. Then you want to do the normal thing of, okay, now I want to go and load more packages that have become available since we did that. And then we have a couple more pa uh, passes which are explicitly to deal with um, if, uh, in the case, for example, you're firing up a VM for the first time and the, the VM has gone around and it's tasted the environment that it's in and it's decided, oh, I'm supposed to be emulating an XYZ, let me go get the XYZ package and mount that and so on. And very often that requires you to then do a reboot so that the box will come up as that particular personality. Um, and then you end up having to do another pass through uh, RC.d, and uh, the, the ultimate one is uh, a lot of our box is configured by a management daemon. We have to allow for third-party packages that need to be able to contribute to that guy doing his work, and then you have another final pass where you're um, dealing with third-party packages that depend on that guy having run and so on. So it gets, it's it's manageable, but the, the main thing is that one, we've, got a chain, we've got changes to basically encapsulate the notion of just call this function to run, do a pass through um, rc.d and break when you get to this marker. Um, and so uh, I think that's probably something that we can upstream. Um, there'll probably be some debate about the names of things. That's always the hard bit. Um, but it's, it's not a particularly radical change. It's just um, allows you to be more flexible in the cases that you need to. And one of the last things that we run and one of the other changes that we make um, in the RC stuff, because we wanna make sure you can't bypass it, is uh, we run an audit script during as late as possible in the RC process so that if you have put any unverified files in, for instance, rcconf.d, it will alert you to them, say, by the way, you've got these unverified files in your boot process. Is that okay with you? Um, and similarly, if you've added trust anchors or maybe somebody's added trust anchors behind your back um, to your system, it will say, hey, you've got these trust anchors enabled that are not part of the core system. Um, that one was explicitly requested by the UK um, equivalent of uh, NSA, I guess. Um, so, but, um, the, the key thing there is you, you want to be, if you're going to try and do that sort of stuff, you need to make sure that it can't be easily disabled. And so you need to bake that into something that is hard to get rid of so that it will, at the end of the day, make sure that did the, uh, did the audit script get run? And if it didn't, let's run it now. Um, so th this is just a list of some of the changes that we've made to RC Sabra and the uh, I guess the last one there is we make it call a local version uh, with, that can do extensions and overrides. We also added a couple of functions. One is called the dot, um, which is the guy who says, hey, if you can verify this, you can read it, otherwise skip it. And then we have a, a dot one, which is just the, the non-verified version, which gets used by default. And if anybody's interested, I've got the implementation there. The other thing that we did is we put back the include of XXX for RC itself. Um, that, that's actually very useful to us. Um, so we do it via a variable so that it's not set by default. But if you have an RC sub local, you can set it there and, or you can set it in rc.conf, anywhere like that. And that will give you that, that hook back um, if you like it. Um, and the other one that is, you know, I, I basically did a RC run scripts, which is the plural of run script, and it just encapsulates the logic of running a pass through rc.d. Um, and uh, yeah, there's another function that we call at the end 
which is where you can do that final wrap up. In our case, it gives us the opportunity to run those extra passes through uh, run scripts, which we want. And it also allows us to do things like um, pulling in our debug thing, which lets us do fancy debug and stuff like that. Uh, that's the implementation. That is v dot. It's very simple. It runs very exec minus x. Some path name will tell you whether or not the file is verified. Um, you'll get an authentication error if it's not. Um, and that's that's pretty much all there is to it. Um, a quick quick touch on key management. Um, we use X509. Uh, it's it's allows for a lot of flexibility, um, which is good. Um, and one of the strong recommendations there, if you if you're getting into this sort of thing, is don't be afraid to add a lot of hierarchy. Um, it's like anything in computer science. If you use enough indirection, you can solve anything. Um, signing keys need to be protected. Um, we use an offline CA that requires, I'm, I'm not sure whether it's two, three, or four people need to each contribute part of the key to get into the room where this thing's kept. Um, sounds, like, sounds like a hassle, but I mean, they only need to go in there like once a year to generate that year's signing key, so it's not a big deal. Um, but it allows us to satisfy any auditors and so on that our CA keys are pretty safe. Um, we used to we used to generate um, signing keys for each release that we did. Um, that worked okay up to a point, um, but when we moved to using um, uh, remote signing servers to hold all the private keys, it was far more effective to just say, we'll have an annual key and that will sign everything that we build that year, and then uh, we'll ge generate a new key next year. Um, as I mentioned, we, we do HSMs for some of our keys. We've evaluated HSMs a few times over the years. We've never actually been very happy with any of them. Um, when we originally did it, we were specifically looking for support for ECDSA. Um, none of them at the time did a good enough job. Um, we've subsequently found one that was almost usable, um, and we, we rolled it out for just holding uh, firmware keys. Um, and I think the consensus that I've heard is that they're not particularly happy with it in terms of reliability and so on. So we front end, those HSMs are all front ended by the same signing server that we use for everything else. So the user, for most of the people who are getting stuff signed, they, they wouldn't notice the difference if the HSMs went away. Um, Let's see, I think that covers everything there. This is an example of the hierarchy for one of our CAs. And I mentioned before that um, you know, customers can opt to revoke a uh, signing key. So originally, we used to um, have the, the development and production uh, signing keys issued by the package CA which worked fine up until you wanted to do this trick of saying, oh, I want to be able to revoke all the dev keys by introducing an extra layer of hierarchy so that you've got a separate dev CA and a separate um, package production CA. You can just revoke that package development CA and anything that it issued becomes null and void. And that makes it trivial to do things like that. So again, having lots of hierarchy in your PKI is um, a good thing. Do, 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 do. Just quickly on the signing server, I've, I've mentioned this to people in the past. Um, we've used it for about 10 years now. I think I wrote it over a, a weekend. It's mostly written in Python. Um, there's a tiny little C module that does all the, the heavy lifting. Um, the back end that we use mostly just uses OpenSSL under the covers. So it can handle pretty much any key that OpenSSL can handle. Um, for interacting with the HSMs, we had, we had to do a proprietary uh, backend that uses PKCS 11 or whatever it is that those things use. Um, it's proved very, very performant, very scalable, um, very flexible. Uh, we run multiple servers in multiple geographies. Um, and uh, one of the biggest problems we find, in a Junos build, we, we build a, our Junos production build is, produces about 700 gig of stuff. 
and there's literally thousands of signatures that, that go into all of that. And so when you have a thousand people doing builds all the time, the, the load on these things is not insignificant, um, but each of these boxes is able to do like thousands of signatures a second, um, and there's multiple at each geography. Um, so we haven't, the reliability of the servers themselves has never been a problem. It's the, one of the most common failure modes we encounter is DNS stops working. Uh, so we added a fallback, say, hey, if, DN if the network's working but DNS is down, here's a default IP to go to um, so that you can still get your signatures. Because it really sucks to have your 700 gig build fail just because DNS stopped working. Um, all right, any questions? Or anything that I went through too quickly? Okay, thank you, cool. Simon. You're welcome. Next up, we have Devin. Hello. So I am presenting on jail network stability today, and uh, thank you for um, Deb for inviting me to come out. I only had like three days to prepare, um, but I'm presenting on something that took me essentially 12 years to reach this date. Um, I used to work for a company that made an appliance that did check processing for banks. It's still in operation today, and it's processing over 2.2 trillion dollars every year in throughput. So is when a company writes a check or receives a check, then the money goes through the appliance. And if your appliance is down for anywhere between five and 30 seconds, you've lost a million dollars of throughput. That's between two and $12 million per day. So downtime is unacceptable. One minute of downtime is unacceptable, let alone the fact that uh, it takes now Five minutes to reboot a server? I mean, the, the ROMs are just taking longer and longer to um, boot the machine. Well, in 2013, I started using VNet jails to take three racks worth of equipment and shove it into one single server. And we had an amazing uh, boon where we were able to then get more banks because fewer and fewer banks want to buy three racks worth of equipment. Uh, so I developed a system that uses all via jails and uses a, a technology in FreeBSD called uh, NetGraph. And so here I'm showing my home network that I've modeled off of the same exact framework that the banks use, except it's gone to level 11. And so every single device has its own subnet, its own gateway, its own IP address for the DNS server and almost everything inside the server, which is handled just one server handling all of this, um, has unique IP addresses for everything in jails. And so we're using NetGraph here. And so this big box here called server, which goes from all the way from the left, down here, all the way up to the right, this is all one machine. So we have lots and lots of jails in this machine. And each one of these jails has its own private network through VNet. And each one of these little things called ng bridge right here, if you say man ng underscore bridge, you're going to get a manual in section four, which is device drivers for the kernel. And these implement protocols for the NetGraph subsystem. And the ng bridge module implements a virtual switch. 
And here we can see I have multiple NG bridges. Uh, when you see A, B, C, D, those are my public IP addresses that I'm not giving out. And then whenever time you see 10.0 or 10.9 or 10.131, these are all the subnets that are specific to each device and jail. No single machine on my network has an overlapping subnet. They're, they are all discrete. So this Netatalk jail here, which serves Apple file sharing to uh, a Mac on my network for time machine backups, has its own IP address in the 10.0.0 subnet for machines that are inside the jail of the host. And if we go back and we look at outside of the jail, each one of these devices, my iPads are 10.0.9, 10.0.10, 10.0.4, 10.0.8, all on slash 24s. No multicast, no broadcast packets ever going to talk to any other machine anywhere on my network. I use PF on every single jail. I use PF on the base machine. I use um, filtering to make sure that no multicast packets get slung around. It's unicast on my network alone. This is extremely high security. And I'm very proud to say that these VPNs right here, one, two, three, four, five, six VPNs do not use WireGuard. They're using MPD5 and Raccoon inside of jails, which is, I think, I don't know, more than 15 years old. And this stuff was written in 1998 at Whistle Network by Julian Ellisher and Archie Cobbs. This stuff is solid, secure, but it had a bug where if you pump enough production information through this network, it will collapse and you'll have to reboot the entire machine. And we first discovered this in 2012 when we started putting it in Wells Fargo. And Bank of America wasn't going to buy it because it, they can't. Bank of America was operating at three times the volume as Wells Fargo. So they couldn't support that type of downtime. So I went deeper and deeper and deeper into the kernel, and I made more and more metric monitoring systems using Grafana. Um, this here, Grafana dashboard, is actually running from a jail inside the server. Uh, it's called Graph. It's somewhere on here. It, this thing is speaking on all these different subnets from 10.0.0 to 10.0.12, plus another five representing the external networks. Um, DHCP is hard-coded to MAC addresses. Where the heck is that? Yeah, I can't even find everything on here because there's so much stuff. There's mail, there's Apple Talk, there's VPNs. I'm not even sure I have it. Okay, so anyway, I'm still in the paranoid state because I, I completely dog-fooded all of this and went to the absolute extreme of putting this all on one FreeBSD server to more than triple the volume that the banks are doing so I could bring the replication time of my issue from 21 days down to about five days. And it, it years, decades passed without ever getting any forward momentum on this bug until I hit this web page right here. I just happened to be doing a search on Google and I found this page by calomel.org. They're a well-known FreeBSD tester, they test Linux and FreeBSD and they report back various things. I've been following them for a few years. Sometimes they have some good stuff, sometimes they don't. Well, there was an optimizer in the sysctl.conf talking about Fortuna entropy harvesting. And lo and behold, this mask right here is a double-edged sword is that when the FreeBSD kernel boots, it does a probe of the hardware to determine what type of faculties your machine has for random entropy harvesting. So the value that you have that's default will be dependent upon your hardware and the FreeBSD version that you're running. What I found is, is that there are two elements in this mask which I don't have a FreeBSD system right now, but every one of these elements in this mask has a symbolic name. FSA time, interrupt, net ether. Well, there's two of them that are bad. Net underscore NG and net underscore tune. What's different about those two are that they're always caught, uh, not net tune, net NG. 
is you're almost always called inside of a VNet context. That's when we talk about inside the kernel, there's the cur underscore VNet macro, which is used to set the private networking instance for the jail and then reclaim it when it's done. So anytime you have these network operations, you find cur VNet block bounding the network operation. Well, when random entropy harvesting occurs in the middle of a cur VNet sta state, uh, what happens is that there's a race condition. It took me 12 years to get to this point so far, that when you turn off net tune and net ng in this mask, your problems go away. And you can run for months and months and months without ever having to reboot your server. This is what the banks want. It's taken me 12 years to find this out. I don't have a patch yet to submit, but the fact that I finally cracked this nut is exciting because we're talking about pillars of FreeBSD, the stability, the age, the, the components inside of it, the things that people like that they come to need to be so rock solid that a nuclear reactor can be run on it or the entirety of all commerce of a whole country, such as the United States. All commerce passes through that appliance that was written by the company that I work for that does $2.2 trillion a year. Almost all commerce, doesn't matter what bank it is, it ends up going through either a Linux-based appliance, if it's a small volume bank, or a FreeBSD-based appliance, which is almost all the banks that are on small volume and want to play with the big boys end up upgrading to FreeBSD. This is what we love. We love the fact that people put their trust in our system, and we have more pillars than Linux ever had. We have the pillar of age, vetting, stability, security, all these things, You're not gonna, it's not gonna fall down on you. So when, in 2013, when my system fell down, it's not having it. So I even built D-Trace daemons, which allow you to introspect all of networking. Uh, here, let me re, re VPN in. Just one second. So here we have my networking uh, dashboard, and I have what a system which I, I ha I've already put into ports. So if you're on freshports.org and you search for dwatch-json, it's a port that has everything you need to do what I'm showing on screen right now. It's actually six months old, and what it is is it, it's got daemons that instrument the kernel with dtrace to produce json that go into influx via telegraph so that you can then take dashboards that come in the same exact package uh, i actually put it over here there we go so if you're on github and you go to fraubsd slash dwatchjson which is where this port comes from in each one of these directories you will find a dashboards directory so like graphnet is the network daemon, and it has a dashboards directory, and in here are some JSON, which you would then import to Grafana. Uh, I will be doing a full top-down uh, article through Alan Jude um, to teach how to do this, but we have uh, disk metrics. So this is a four-disk Z pool, which shows uh, all of the individual disks and their activity and these dashboards are extremely fast, extremely responsive. Here's 24 hours, here's seven days worth. I'm doing this over VPN on 5G too. Here's 30 days. When do I get to the, uh, I actually found that I had some errors in the past 90 days, maybe. Yeah, ooh, 34 errors. And I can then filter on which disk, was that the AHCI? I think it's the AHCI. So this disk right here shows, I can see its contribution to the zpool performance, and I see that the errors were actually on ADA0. So I probably should go replace ADA0. It's probably a good idea. Meanwhile, on network, I've got multiple dashboards here. I've got, uh, if you want device IO aggregate or you want rates. And do you want your rates in bits per second or bytes per second? Um, what you do with this setup, 
eventually you'll see is that there's a config file where if you've ever used a TCP dump command in order to tell yourself, um, I mean, to, to, to introspect what's happening on your network, you might have to tell TCP dump what to look for. So you, you filter the fire hose. There's a config file behind all this. And you just tell in the config file, you speak actual dtrace, and you can say if the source IP is this and this destination port is this, you know, then give it this label. So I've got all these labels. So we can see that the jail that I'm actually using right now to display these dashboards is called graph jail, and that's its contribution as a whole to my network. I'm actually hiding some things here. If I were to hide nothing, you can see everything on my network. And you can see that there's a VPN. Somebody in my household is using their iPad, which is stressing the VPN called Patius. And then the, there's the tablet side of it. Then I have a Mac on my network called uh, Rose. And then it, there's its time machine backup. Um, I can, I want to just show you here for a second. I've got my phone here, and so I'm filtered on VPN right now. All I'm going to do is turn on my VPN on my phone, and we'll see it start to light up. I might have to load some things, like some mail or something. I don't know. Refresh. Okay, right now this green guy is uh, that iPad, we'll just turn that off. I can also hide it, hide, just to hide that laptop. There we go. Fraggle is the name that I've given the VPN for my phone. So there, we just saw it jump from zero, non-existent, to 7.5K per second. And we've touched on that, touched on that, touched on that that, there's the inspiration, the internal network, yeah. Um, any questions? Yes. Say again with the mic microphone. Did you separate random net tune from random net NG? Did I, did I do what? Uh, did you try to disable either of them? Disable? Um, yes, I did. So, so enabling either of them uh, creates the bug? Yes. So if you, ha if you have net, so in the kernel, the, the name of the enum is rand underscore net underscore tune and rand underscore net underscore ng. Turning those off in the harvest for tuna mask causes the problem to go away. And I know this for a fact because with all of this information, uh, here I'll show you just how bad things got. I uh, just want to clarify that yeah. either of them, I'll show you what, what it looks either like of them without. introduces the bug. Yes. Correct. Okay. Well, it's, it's, okay, so whenever I negotiated a, a VPN, I'm tapping into a jailed MPD-5 which then incurs a call to uh, Neptune Harvest Mask. Okay, so that, I hit that much less often than I do, obviously, the net graph, which is the whole system is net graph. Turning off n just net NG almost triples the amount of time I can run before hitting the bug, but I still hit the bug. Disabling net NG and Neptune, I never hit it, ever. Um, I'll show you what, it, what my what my time what my system looked like. So look, if I rewind six months, you can see there's huge gaps in my graph, where everything just stopped working, and it's a while before I can actually get to the machine and, and reboot it. So it's, it's a pain. Um, these gaps are no bueno. So, I'll be on. I'm gonna hide. No, this is disk block. Let's go to network. I want to hide none. Okay. Show all. Let's 
do a six month view. Max rate 16.2 megs a second, not bad. So here we have good data. Oh, yeah. You see back here? This is where everything was going to crap. Uh, nothing, pardon my language. But uh, I had not found the bug yet. I was still trying to figure it out. Everything from here to the right, with the exception of that one little hiccup right there, this is evidence that the problem is fixed and not reoccurring. Now if I go back even more to the previous six months before that, you see it's even worse, where stability was just unreliable. There you go. So I looked at the function in the random code. Yeah. And it has this comment which says that it's morally reprehensible to use this function for any high rate data. Um, and in, in your case, with Tune and NG, you're passing, it's basically every packet that your system is doing yeah. it, which probably counts as high rate. I don't know why that would cause it to lock up, but one thing I want to look at is we have one for every Ethernet packet, and I suspect that's off by default. Well, the type of lockup. In which case, is, that's off by default, yeah. then like that would expose it on a broader range if we were to do that. Um, and probably if it's off by default for Ethernet, it's probably off by default for NetGraph and ToonTap as well. Yeah, now there's guess. two interesting things I should point out is that uh, blacklisting these entropy points for harvesting is not necessarily the best solution. We still want entropy to be harvested, but there are two points where I tried to enable and I literally could not because the kernel will not allow me to turn on um, net ether. Ran net ether would be great because I could just harvest entropy off every incoming ethernet packet. I bet that breaks even faster. Well, it's, you can't turn it on. It I, won't let you. I'm, so I'll, I'll look at that. I bet we turn it off because it breaks. But it Alan in. Jude said, just turn on net ether. I'm like, it, um, I can't. I bet you don't want, I, I would say on any modern system, because you have read rand yeah. from your CPU, that's probably all the entropy you're ever going to want. So probably turning these off by default is probably just fine. Yeah, probably. Um, I will have to double the hash size. So over on Calomel, we noticed that they do another no, um, tune on Fortuna, the min pool size. That's also a good edit. I, I found that that's good. I think that's a good default maybe to have upstream. Just double it, just double what it is. It significantly improves my perf network performance and lowers the amount of um, delays that I experience when entropy is low because I've blacklisted two harvesting points. Um, and but the last point I will say is that the nature of the hang that's caused me the other three for 12 years is such that UDP is completely unaffected, 100% unaffected. It's only TCP, and I suspect that maybe it's something in the header, like the sequence number. And when it does occur, the only real thing you'll notice is that you'll get E timeout on every connect. Every single connect will E timeout. Doesn't matter if it's internal or external. So across I have a down. suggestion. Yeah. Um, one of the things we will do in TCP is we will allocate, we'll use a random number for the initial sequence number. So that's a call into the random number generator to get one. So if for some reason we think we're out of entropy and we block in that for some god awful reason, then every connection attempt will hang. And so what you could do is, um, when you get a hang, get the stack trace with proc stat of like a socket, of, of a process stuck in I accept or something like that. And I did see that, and it's only it three functions. It's basically syscall to connect. Right? You know, the syscall handler to syscall to connect. It's bad. Okay, then probably the stack trace is just not deep enough. Yeah. But we, can, uh, we can maybe follow up. I know you have the thread on developers, so maybe we can dig some more there. Yeah, so it's really great to be able to then have 10 years after leaving the banks to be able to finally say that, hey, you know, this thing, I can guarantee you now, you'll have less than six reboots required a year. And it's, I'm only saying that as a low bar because I suspect that it, I've actually fixed, I suspect I've fixed the problem permanently. I just don't have the data to prove it yet. As you saw, I've only got 60 days worth of data to prove that this, this, this massive problem 
um, is gone. Like these gaps right here. Where we can see that UDP I, is still, it's still functional, but those red lines right there are proof that it, it's not good. You know. The last 60 days are all gravy. Well, very cool. Thank you very much, Devin. Thank you. So we've got two more left. We have Brooks and then Pavel's after Brooks. All right. Yeah, I, I, I realized after my talk that I had uh, yesterday that I had forgotten to mention a couple things that I did want to talk to the group about. Um, in particular, and so I just want to give a quick re rehash and talk a little more about uh, avenues for exploring Cherry in your company. So first thing, um, I think I mentioned the technical access program from UKRI. Um, I did actually learn something after, the f after that, which is I said it's for UK companies. Um, turns out you could be a US company, um, and at least with a good, you know, the, so if you go to the web page, and you click the request board bu button and give them a good write-up of what you plan to do. Um, it is at least possible to get boards. Um, if, you, if you want to do that, um, you might want to shoot us an email um, that you've done it. And, uh, and uh, if, if you don't get a response back, uh, we can poke people um, and, uh, and see if something's stuck somewhere. Um, so that I would say under this program, over 70 companies have tried uh, FreeBSD on uh, Cherry, and a number of them have like found bugs that they haven't found with their other testing tools, um, and had really good luck that way. Um, and we've introduced a whole lot of people to FreeBSD, which is really fun. Um, and several of them have said we want to keep the boxes, not because you know like we you know we know we're not going to ship a product on it immediately because there isn't something to ship it on, but we want to keep it in our CI environment because we want to keep finding bugs. Um, and then the other source I think of sort of funding and opportunities to, to uh, collaborate here is that I think that um, the US government has a bunch of funding, the US government does have a bunch of funding for technology transition. So they funded the initial work on Cherry, uh, DARPA, and uh, DARPA technology transition funding um, would be one way to partner with experienced Cherry people so we could help you out um, with your explorations. Um, I think if you had an interesting proposal for something you wanted to do, um, we could go uh, together and propose to DARPA. Um, there's a bunch of sources. My understanding is right now there's quite a bit of transition money um, available, and especially the sort of the easiest funding model is for small businesses. Small businesses are really big. Um, in computing, they're like on the order of 1,000 plus or minus 200. Um, so um, many startups, many, many tech companies are, would be counted as small, and it's pretty easy to get you know, a couple million dollars to run a trial. Um, so if you're interested, um, you wanna try Cherry out, maybe, maybe get a little funding to help offset the research cost, um, talk to us and you know, let's see if we can come up with something and, and pitch something. So that's, that's all I wanted to say. Thanks. Any questions, comments, or catch me before I run away later? <laughs> Okay, next up is Pavel. Uh, hi, uh, I have no slides. Uh, just a quick demonstration of what I've been working on uh, lately. So this is work uh, that was uh, sponsored initially by Clara, the, the first version. So this is about introducing rate limiting for ZFS. So uh, uh, of course ZFS, you can create uh, granularly uh, data sets and if you use ZFS with like jails or virtual machines, 
it would be nice to be able to, to limit uh, uh, the amount of, uh, to limit, for example, throughput or number of operations that the given jail is able to do on, on its own data set so, uh, so we can avoid situations where one jail will basically take all the resources. Uh, so uh, there are a few new uh, properties. We can uh, limit uh, read bandwidth, write bandwidth, or total bandwidth, which is read plus write, and number of operations. Uh, in ZFS, but in general, this is pretty hard to be able to limit uh, how much uh, actually is read from the disk, especially in case of ZFS, where we write, ZFS doesn't really write the data to the disk immediately. It accumulates all the changes, and then we'll, once we uh, try to uh, commit transaction group, it will start writing. But then it's already too late to try to separate data from different data set because it would just slow down the entire transaction group, so everyone uh, will need to wait. So we cannot do that. So we were considering doing uh, uh, some stuff in the middle, like for reads, we could do that maybe, and for writes, uh, we can't, but uh, I think the most important part is to, uh, to provide some kind of predictability that we can actually measure how much uh, applications or jails are reading or writing, and based on that, set up limits or have some, uh, some predictions. Uh, so uh, so do this rate limiting is, uh, doesn't uh, take into account any caching or anything like compression or anything like this. So we basically operate at VFS level. So whatever somebody is trying to read, we will accumulate those account for, for, uh, for the number of reads. Or, uh, and in case of operations, those are like VFS operations like uh, change mode, change own. Uh, reads and writes are also accounted for so for example, if you have record size of 128 kilobytes and you read one megabyte, we'll, this will account for eight operations. Uh, and the first version wasn't hierarchical, so we could only put limit on the given data set, uh, but we couldn't have like the, uh, the parent to also have a limit and, uh, uh, and accumulate for all the children. Uh, so. For example, in this case, I have uh, those data sets. So the, the top level data set have no limit. Then we have 10 megabytes uh, uh, read throughput, and then bar and bus have eight and six. But accumulative limit is, is 10 megabytes. So if I try to read from, uh, from the rate file system, there, are, there is no limit, so it's pretty quick. But then if I try to read from the full file system, uh, it should obey 10 megabytes per second limit. Uh, and if I try to read, for example, I will run four processes reading from bar and bus. So uh, those limits should give us 14 megabytes, but because we have like the top limit, so we are limited to 10 megabytes uh, for all those file systems. So hopefully this will, limit will be obeyed. Mm. I should have given smaller numbers. <laughs> okay, so uh, four times 2.5, it's more or less 10 megabytes. So, uh, yes, it's, it's not fully, the work is not fully done, but this is something that might be interesting to people, so I wanted to show it. Thank you. Thanks, Pavel. Okay. We are near the end. So I have a few things I'd like to say to close us out from our conference over the last two days. <laughs> 
So uh, thank you all. Well, I'll get to the thank you alls, but I guess I'll say it anyway. Thank you all for coming and attending and helping this be a successful conference. Uh, so the folks who organized this, we do value your feedback and knowing how we did and what things we can do in the future to make future summits and conferences like, like this better. So we, do, we have put together a brief survey. It should only take a couple of minutes. Uh, if you're able to fill it out, we would appreciate it. Uh, and I'll leave this slide up at the end uh, after we're done with, our, with the rest of the, my little spiel here. Um, I mentioned earlier we have some upcoming conferences in the BSD world uh, coming up in the next year or so. So Asia BSD Con is in March, um, and their call for papers is currently open. And if you're very interested in that, Satosan is here. You can ask him about it if you want more details. Um, BSD Can in Ottawa, as Michael alluded to, that's coming up in the end of May. That's always a, a big event in the BSD world. We'll have a developer summit there like we do every year, um, where many FreeBSD folks will be together during the tutorial days. Uh, and EuroBSD Con will be in Ireland next year. Um, I will probably be there and many other folks. So always welcome to see more faces there. I want to give a big shout out one last time as we wrap up to our sponsors. So yeah, a big thanks to NetApp um, for hosting us, providing the space. Thanks to Jishnu for organizing all this um, on our behalf and kind of donating a lot of time. Thanks to all our AV techs in the back who've managed all our sound and helped with uh, our visual, our slides, and so forth. Thanks to the FreeBSD Foundation who helped a bunch. A lot of folks who are foundation staff spent a lot of time. Uh, Deva mentioned to it earlier that there's a group of us we meet once a week, almost year round, between this summit and planning the Dev Summit in BSD CAN. Um, so they really spent a lot of time organizing, helping solicit talks, managing the logistics. I know Anne spent a lot of time, as Deb mentioned, and she wasn't able to be here this week. But thank you to those folks and for all the support from the foundation. And then I've got a few more folks. Um, thank you to all our speakers. To have a successful conference, we need content. And the content comes from our speakers. So we really appreciate all our speakers who spent time to come up with content, um, thought about what you wanted to say, took the effort to draw up slides and prepare your notes and practice what you were going to. That really allows us to have a conference. We, if we all can sit in here for two hours, we'll be bored after a little while. So we need content. We really appreciate that. We couldn't have a conference without speakers. Thank you to all our attendees. Speakers don't want to talk to an empty room, right? Um, it, it, this is an interactive thing for all of us where we are presenting, we're getting feedback, we're talking to each other, so it's, it's all a group event. And so our attendees are really important as well. Uh, thank you to our live stream team. So I've had some folks um, that I work with who've been here to help run our cameras and our switches. Um, we had Brian yesterday and then Ricky and Hope today who've been helping us out. Thanks also to Scale Engine, which is one of Alan's companies, along with Clara. Uh, they've donated the resources to allow us to actually manage. Uh, once the stream leaves the building here, they took care of actually sending it to YouTube and managing recordings and things like that. Uh, and finally, thanks to our organizing committee, uh, which includes folks in the foundation, such as Deb and Anne, Lauren, who's in the back room, uh, back table there, um, and Ed Mast. Uh, so thank you from all of us for coming. We look forward to seeing you uh, at our other conferences and at a vendor summit next year. Uh, and with that, I think we are done. Please take swag. There's still swag on the back table. <laughs> Bye to everyone in the stream. Uh, for those who are here, we are going to take a little while to pack up. You can still stay and chat for a while, um, but please kind of be out of the room and on your way by at least 6 o'clock. We don't want to have folks stay a long time. Uh, they want to be able to get home on Friday night to their families.